Thank you all for joining us. I'm Steve Clemens uh, with a new title. Although I'm senior fellow and founder of the American Strategy at the New America Foundation, I'm the new Washington editor-at-large uh, of The Atlantic and editor-in-chief of Atlantic Live. This is my first event uh, on behalf of The Atlantic. We're very happy that all of you could join us this morning uh, in the Senate. Uh, I will not be um, uh, disturbed at all if many of you rush back to the coffee. We were worried that the Coca-Cola company had tried to put the coffee business out of business here. Uh, in the Senate, you know, some sort of non-binding or binding contract. Uh, but the coffee has arrived. I want to thank Senate Catering uh, for doing that. I also want to thank uh, Senator John Kerry's staff uh, this morning, uh, particularly Heidi Crabo Redeker, who has just uh, arrived, uh, flown in from uh, Egypt uh, last night, and is is the genius behind much of what we're going to be talking about today: the Build Act, uh, the need for an American infrastructure bank and America's infrastructure deficits. We'll be debating and discussing this, and we have an outstanding program to do it. Our underwriter and supporter this morning, Bernard Schwartz, will be here and making some comments later. He's on his way uh, from the airport just flying in and caught in a bit of traffic. But we're going to proceed with the program because we have a very full packed day. Um, let me just say a few words about my, my colleagues and, and who have been working on this issue for some time. Cheryl Schweninger and Michael Lind, uh, when, when she was with us, Heidi Crabo, Redeker, and others, we've been talking for a long time about how do you deal structurally with the fact that uh, the backbone of American infrastructure uh, has been crumbling, and yet neither governments nor markets have been able to address this. What are, the, what are some of the missing features? Uh, you may remember in a previous Congress, uh, Senator Dodd, Senator Hagel uh, worked uh, hard to try to push forward uh, the notion of the infrastructure bank. Now Senator John Kerry, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, Senator Mark Warner in the Senate uh, have been important players in this. Rosa DeLauro, uh, who will be joining this afternoon, will also be addressing this. And we have an outstanding program this morning um, of a great panel here and, and who are going to try and cover a lot of ground and, and try and highlight uh, for us how an infrastructure bank could work from a variety of different perspectives. Or perhaps they're going to kick the tires and say, you know, there are other pieces of this that really need to be thought. I want to quickly recognize uh, the fact that there are a lot of folks on various uh, websites, including uh, The Atlantic, uh, The Washington Note, uh, which I run, uh, watching live. So we have various people participating on the outside as well. Without further ado, let me introduce my colleague and great friend and partner, Michael Hirsch, uh, Chief Correspondent of National Journal. Of course, we uh, knew him uh, at Newsweek. He's written the best book on kind of, uh, I would call it, if you really want to have a page turner on D.C. structural corruption in the economic area. Capital Offense uh, is out there. Buy it. Get it. Uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, he did not ask me to say it. I really, really love that book. Uh, so without further ado, the chairman of this panel is Michael Hirsch. Uh, please give him a warm round of applause. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, for the... Uh, unrequested shout out to the book. Probably uh, I'm hardly the uh, only book author here, so you're all aware of how much that means. Um, without further ado, um, let's get to the subject uh, at hand. Um, there's no question uh, of the need for a dramatic attention to uh, America's crumbling infrastructure. The American Society of uh, civil engineers uh, estimates that uh, under current plans uh, there would still be some $2.2 .2 trillion worth of improvements needed uh, for the nation's uh, roads, uh, bridges, waterways, uh, which are, are failing. Uh, additional attention uh, has been brought to this issue because of the perceived uh, competition from abroad, um, uh, countries uh, like China uh, and uh, Japan and the European countries, which are uh, seemingly doing a better job of uh, investing in their infrastructure. Uh, and the issue comes to our attention at a time when Washington's almost exclusive focus uh, is on cutting spending. Uh, uh, the de democratic approach has been to say, let's invest education, infrastructure, uh, but the Republican response has been that's just another uh, Democratic code word uh, for spending and we don't want to do that. 
Uh, now, in the middle of this, uh, we have uh, had a couple of interesting proposals, uh, one of which uh, was just introduced uh, in March uh, by Senators uh, Kerry, uh, uh, Mark Warner, and Kay Bailey Hutchinson on the Republican side uh, uh, to create a national infrastructure bank. Uh, it has the very distinctive, and I would say extremely rare in this environment, uh, uh, quality of, of, uh, of having been supported both by uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO. Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss today with uh, really a remarkable panel uh, of experts, uh, beginning with, uh, on my uh, immediate, pardon me, seem to be uh, black, here we go, on my immediate uh, right, Brian Palish, who's the managing director uh, uh, for Government Relations and Infrastructure Initiative at the American Society of uh, Civil Engineers, uh, which I just, uh, whose study I just cited. Uh, to his right, uh, Tyler Duval, Associate Principal with McKinsey, and uh, a former Acting Undersecretary for Policy at the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation, uh, Michael Lakowski, pardon me, Director uh, of the Center on Law and Public Finance, the Social Science Research Council, uh, former uh, and, and a current senior fellow at NYU's Institute for Public Knowledge. He's the author of five books, including uh, uh, one called Obama's Bank, Financing a Durable New Deal. Robert Dove, Managing Director of the Carlisle Group, former senior vice president of Bechtel, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the Financing Development and Investment Unit of Bechtel Group. And Cheryl uh, Schwenninger, who is the director for the Economic Growth Program and the co-director of the Smart Globalization Initiative at the New America Foundation. He's also a co-founder uh, of the New America Foundation and the co-author with Bernard Schwartz, one of our sponsors today, of an economic recovery program for the post-bubble economy. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists in turn to speak for uh, several minutes. Uh, and either make the case for or against uh, the idea of the National Infrastructure Bank, whether it's the one um, embodied in the bill I just mentioned or some other version of it, or whether there should be some alternative approach to dealing with our infrastructure problem. Mr. Pellash? Thank you. I, I think I'll start by setting the stage and giving you some of the numbers that, that ASCE is uh, rather well known for. As a nation, uh, we cannot thrive economically or socially without the solid foundation of well-performing infrastructure systems, whether they be surface transportation, water, water resources, uh, energy. But for decades, we've allowed those systems to crumble, not only through inattention, but also under investment. In 2009, as I think you're all aware, and I appreciate the plug, uh, ASCE's report card gave the nation a grade of D. Uh, and we noted that we needed to spend about $2.2 trillion to get the grades up to what we call a B level. Uh, some of us uh, maybe want a little bit better than that, but a B is pretty good. I'm happy when my kids bring home a B from school. Um, and, and by our calculations, at least the calculations before this desire to spend less money, we felt that through the next five years, starting in 2009, that the, that, the, that the federal, state, and local governments would spend about $1 trillion to $1.1 trillion of that $2.2 trillion. Uh, so we have a little bit, a little ways to go to, uh, to get to that B. And, and if we look at some of the things more specifically, we still are faced in this country with 26% of our bridges that are functionally obsolete or structurally deficient. Uh, we're supposed to be spending, to, to get rid of that backlog, about $17 billion a year to fix our nation's bridges, to, to get rid of that, that backlog. We only spend about $10 billion, $10.5 billion a year. Uh, we as Americans spend 34 hours a year stuck in traffic. Not only does that cost us time, but you can calculate that in terms of money, and it's about $115 billion wasted every year, uh, not only in gas but in time. That's about $800 per motorist. Not to mention the cost of the conditions, if you run over a, a big pothole in your car and you break your axle or pop a tire, that's at $67 billion. Um, but really, at this point, from all levels of government, we're only spending about $70 billion a year on capital improvements. 
to the nation's infrastructure system. And depending on whose estimates you use, we should be spending about $180 billion. And there's a bunch of estimates, but $180 billion would get you close to that B grade. We've got transit use where that seems to increase greatly when we pay $4 a gallon for gas. But as we all know, certainly in the Washington area, our transit systems need more investment as well. The escalators don't work, the cars are getting old, and, and that needs more work as well. Drinking water and wastewater, that's sort of the unseen infrastructure. We're lucky enough to have clean water every day, but, but we do lose a good deal of water every day that's treated. Seven billion gallons of clean and treated water are lost every day to water main breaks. Um, no one's been able to really put a cost on that, but that's an expensive cost because it does cost money to treat water. We face an annual shortfall in drinking water of, of, in terms of the investment levels of $11 billion a year to replace those aging systems. And that really, that, that's an EPA estimate, and that doesn't account for any growth. And we know from, from, uh, from demographers that we'll have another 100 million people in this country in the next 20 to 30 years. Communities are trying to search for new ways to deal with these problems. In Orange County, they actually have a groundwater replenishment system which takes highly treated sewage water and puts it back into aquifers so that eventually someday it will come back into the drinking water system. Um, another thing that, uh, that, that remains rather vulnerable, and I think we're seeing it right now, is our water resources infrastructure. We've witnessed this spring the largest floods since, uh, since the 1930s, and the levees are basically right now just holding. Um, we don't have a good sense of where all the levees are. We're probably finding a few more of them today because they're holding back some of the water. We think, we have, we think there's about 100,000 miles of levees in this country. We haven't done a good inventory of those levees. If we actually went about the process of trying to repair and, and replace some of those levees, we're talking probably close to $100 billion, and there's no source of funds for that, that activity. Uh, the risk to public health and safety from, a fa from failures has increased, and it's not just New Orleans that's at risk. We've seen cities all up and down the Mississippi River who, who are at risk today uh, from, from levees failing. In addition to that, if you're not aware, uh, Sacramento, California is ringed by levees, and if those levees fail, um, not only do the people in Sacramento have problems, but the people in Los Angeles have problems because their drinking water becomes, con becomes contaminated uh, with salt water as a result of the levee failures. I know this is a rather bleak picture, but I have to say as a nation, we have to stop asking whether or not we can afford to invest in these critical systems by increasing our funding. We have to start asking ourselves how we can afford not to. So it's not really a question of can we afford it, it's we must afford it. I think as a nation we deserve better than to settle for failing infrastructure. Our future prosperity depends on an immediate and long-term commitment of both resources and leadership to rebuilding the nation's infrastructure systems. We commend the senators who have introduced the BUILD Act uh, for, bringing their, for putting their efforts behind bringing attention to the nation's infrastructure crisis. And we call on all the leaders, both in Congress and, and uh, in, in the White House and in agencies and at the state and local level, to start, uh, to start coming up with better solutions and, uh, and, and, and start solving these problems. I'd also like to note that while to, that innovative financing is not really a replacement for funding. The Infrastructure Bank is a tremendous first step forward and it's gotten us to be discussing a lot more about how we invest more creatively in our infrastructure. We support the these kinds of initiatives about innovative financing programs and we think it's going to be an, an important tool in that toolbox to, to use an overused phrase. But the federal government should make additional efforts to develop new programs, not only financing programs, but funding programs. Uh, and the, and, and the bank is one of the ways to do that. We think the bank should be capitalized initially by general fund appropriations and should hopefully be self-sustaining in the near term, that it should develop financing pro packages for selected projects and, and w would create some sort of a mechanism to pick good projects, if you will, and it should have performance measures for those projects. We should not replace existing infrastructure funding and financing mechanisms just because we have an infrastructure bank, but it should act as a supplement 
and be leveraged to federal, state, and local and private infrastructure financing. So with that, I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Mr. Duvall? Great, thanks. Uh, so I, I work for a, a really large consulting firm. We don't take official policy positions. We provide analytics, and it's very <laughs> painful for me to have to admit that, given I spent seven years doing federal policy. But So I'm not going to take an official position on the bank. I'm actually just going to bring some lessons from previous life running the largest, helping run the largest infrastructure finance vehicle at the federal level at the Department of Transportation, and then also kind of reflect on some of these <laughs> fundamental problems that, that Brian just talked about, which I think are pretty, pretty relevant to the discussion. So when, when thinking about kind of structuring an infrastructure finance vehicle, I, I think that some of the important lessons kind of over the last 10 years out of the TIFIA program at the U.S. Department of Transportation uh, are pretty relevant to the discussion you're, you're having today. Uh, first and foremost, I think you need certainty. Uh, you need certainty across two dimensions. You need certainty of criteria. Uh, and you need certainty of funding. Uh, the current TIFIA program is subject to the exact same appropriations process, obviously, that everything else in the federal government, uh, not on the mandatory side, is subject to. That provides a lot of uncertainty on a day-to-day -day basis to administer the program. Every time the budget cycle comes around, you have a queue of borrowers that is simply waiting, obviously, for this appropriation. Huge amount of pent-up capital that obviously doesn't get deployed in that, in that circumstance. For about the first 10 years of that program, there was so much excess lending capacity that the question of criteria was largely irrelevant. The department did not need to decide which types of projects were good projects, which types of ones were bad ones. Basically, if you had, if you had a loan, if you had a, a project that needed some credit assistance, uh, we could provide it, assuming you could meet some basic credit thresholds. Very, very. Uh, if you could, you know, meet debt service coverage ratios, you're good to go. That changed precipitously, you know, basically in the 06, 07, 08 time frame, and now there is a queue of projects that's substantial, huge amount of capital is waiting to be deployed through that program today. Uh, and for the first time ever, the program has actually needed to adopt some criteria. That has been a bit of a bumpy process uh, because the policy views of obviously this administration, the previous administration, there are all these views that get into that process. There needs to be some certainty about what that criteria is. Borrowers need to know before they fill, you know, start to collect all the capital, deal with these big private equity funds like you hear about. They need to understand what the criteria is going to be for making these loan decisions. It's a very basic point, but the program has been a bit overrun, I think, by the, the surge in demand which is a good indicator that credit assistance at the federal level is fundamental, part of the fundamental solution, not the whole one, which I'll talk about. But th there needs to be an emphasis on, on, on criteria certainty. I know the legislation speaks to that, but a lot of the devil will be in the details and should not be, uh, should not be left to, uh, to later days. Uh, subordination is a huge component, I think, both from a risk perspective and from, uh, you know, attracting private, uh, private sector lenders. Uh, at the end of the day, and I know that the current legislation that's being talked about a little bit has a 50 percent uh, threshold uh, for the project size, the presence of senior lenders outside the federal government who are actually on the hook for some of the risk of these projects is really fundamental. As good as you, the federal government can be at risk assessment, it's always great to have another set of eyes. And obviously, we've had some, some, some pretty big failures at the federal level with respect to risk. Uh, and I think that is a core component of this program. There needs to be some real exposure uh, from senior lenders who are asking really tough questions uh, to, to potential borrowers. Uh, Related to, to subordination, I think, is, this, is, is basically the question uh, of how quickly you can process. The, bringing in another entity into the equation obviously complicates the, the loan process. Uh, speed is really, really important. And so they're striking a balance between kind of employing lean processes without compromising risk, I think, is really you know, part of the success, and, and that is the sweet spot. Right now, it's taking an extremely long time to process infrastructure loans uh, at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Whether a new entity could come up with, there are better processes, whether a new entity could come up with those is a big question. And I would focus not simply on, you know, what the criteria are, but what is the process to get to yes or no in a very timely fashion. There's, this capital will flow elsewhere. There are a lot of projects around the globe that are basically ready to go. Uh, and if the United States is not able to basically expedite its decision processes across the board, frankly, but from permitting to loan processing decisions, you'll simply see capital to go to other countries. I mean, the, the boom going on in Asia and South America right now uh, is a, with legal certainty, by the way. I mean, there's a lot of sense that, you know, investing in these parts of the world is not, not you know, legally certain. The procurement processes aren't good. That is changing as we speak. In fact, you're seeing some of the most sophisticated procurement processes in the world being installed in other countries, not in the United States. That will provide certainty, but it means there's a competition for capital that is, that is brand new and the U.S., uh, frankly, needs to recognize. 
As Brian mentioned, though, the cost of finance or cost of capital is really only part of the overall infrastructure you know, failure in the U.S. If, if an entity like is being discussed today actually focused on reversing some of these more fundamental failures, it would actually have a really powerful effect. And the way we group these fundamental failures are on the operating, you know, basically on the, on the cost side, on the revenue side, and on the resource allocation side. Currently, the cost, the, co the cost of delivering projects beyond the cost of capital itself uh, is simply too high. We've seen flat or declining low labor productivity in the U.S. One minute. I have one minute. Great. I'm going to wrap up. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the labor productivity in the United States is flat or declining. The cost of operating is simply, uh, basically not matching what you've seen in under, other industrialized sectors. So we need to unleash a wave of basically innovation to drive down the long-term cost of infrastructure in the U.S., and the bank could focus on that. On the revenue side, it was noted we don't have a sustainable revenue mechanism for infrastructure. Uh, uh, you know, if you lower the cost of capital by 20 percent, you still have a problem that you need to generate revenues to, to finance those investments. We don't have a sustainable model. And lastly, the deployment of capital itself. Very few metrics used in the United States to deploy huge amounts of capital. Return on investment, which is used by every capital intensive business in the world, uh, is not used in the public sector to deploy capital. We don't see any performance metrics associated with that deployment. And again, at the end of the day, if those fundamental failures are not addressed, we will have a chronic infrastructure needs gap uh, that will not be solved by reducing the cost of finance. Thank you. Mr. Lukowski? Thanks. So uh, I think I'm going to build on uh, stuff that's been said, but maybe cut to the chase a little bit in my position or my view on the uh, banks that are on the table and then give some reason why. So I think our central challenge is to figure out ways of, in a time of deficit crisis, and it's not going to go away once the deficit ceiling gets taken care of, right? So we're going to be living with this for a while and the fights around it, the perennial fights around it. Um, how do we move away from fighting over uh, pieces of a shrinking pie towards growing an economic pie? And infrastructure has a major role to play in this. and um, and an infrastructure uh, bank has a significant uh, key role to play in, in finding ways to uh, grow that infrastructure pie. And I think there's really five aspects of the, uh, of, the, of the Build Act of the American Infrastructure Finance Authority that I think are essential, regardless of how things move forward, I think are key aspects that have to be in a bank for it to be workable, in, in my view, and based upon a lot of experience, and I think others on the panel have experience working internationally and looking why does the U.S. have a dysfunctional public-private partnership market, um, whereas it's fairly vibrant in other places. And I'd say one of the key reasons is everywhere in the world, including Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Asia, benefits from an infrastructure bank of some sort. Um, we, we just don't have that. And the characteristics of an infrastructure bank that I think are essential is, one, this merit-based selection that we've been discussing. Uh, two is independence. So I think it has to be an independent entity, and, and I'll say something a little bit about that in a moment. Um, this further, it has to be a multi-sector bank, uh, and because we face a multi-sector crisis. We're not facing a single sector crisis. And there has to be some congressional role in the United States. I think we have to deal with some of the front-end political problems, front-end head-on. We, otherwise, we end up situa the situation we're in now, which we cannot we have difficulty closing projects, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not so good reasons. And we have a very difficult time transitioning projects from one administration to another if there's a change of political party. So these are things that can only get solved by incorporating C Congress has to play a key role in the bank, and the same thing has to happen at the state, at the state level. And then on the financing devices, a bank is, is going to be one part of the picture. And I think there's a few aspects um, that are represented in the financing authority that I think have to be key. I think, there, I think there's, a, there's a very strong case to be made for having loan, only loans and loan guarantees in a bank. Um, there's plenty of places for grants um, and also further the discipline that comes with the need to become self-sustaining self over time. I think the combination of that will affect the merit-based decision making. Um, and once again, it's not meant to cover everything, but there's a certain cla a class of projects that, um, that this gets at. So what's the payoff for, for setting up a bank, um, and how does it address some of, these, uh, some, of this, some of these underlying issues? Well, most, when public-private partnerships have been most effective and when infrastructure banks have been most effective over the last 30 years have been in countries that are facing severe budgetary crisis and have to find ways of bringing money into the infrastructure sector. And right now, we're in a classic situation that countries throughout Asia faced 
Um, so Southern China be wasn't developed before it started to get involved with this. The World Wide Web was laid through public-private partnerships through these sorts of banks and mechanisms, the physical infrastructure of it, um, the fiber optic cables, the cell networks, um, the container port retrofits around the world were laid, were put together with public-private partnerships that allowed ships to move. Um, when the only reason, the chip fabrication plants didn't move from Silicon Valley to East Asia because the labor cost was less, they moved because there was a heavy investment in the water and power infrastructure that made chip fabrication possible and made it, made it less costly. So the location advantage of the United States benefits from investment in, uh, in this multi-sector infrastructure bank that other places have benefited from. Um, it also brings, um, and, and just say something about the financing and then, um, and then move over to, uh, to Robert, the, the benefit of, of the financing mechanism is essentially that it's, it's about bringing an additional pot of capital to bear on the problem. Right? So right now, large, um, a large amount of money sits in pension funds, um, I think Tyler indicated it's, it goes into East Asia, it goes into places that are less, often less attractive than the U.S. Uh, and it does so only because the U.S. hasn't figured out a way of, of anchoring this private capital, using it effectively um, in a way that syncs up with our public goals. And that's a challenge that we can address and meet. Uh, and I think we have to shift away from posing these things as, well, this makes it a, no, a non-starter towards saying, well, this is an easier challenge to face than the idea that we're going to, in the, within this deficit ceiling debate, increase dramatically um, the amount of money for infrastructure necessary to grow the, grow the pie sufficiently and to return to a uh, situation where the U.S. exports more than it, than it imports. Thank you. Mr. Dove? Good morning. My name is Robert Dove, and I am the co-head of the $1.2 billion Carlisle Infrastructure Fund, which was raised specifically to invest in infrastructure projects in the United States. I will join a long list of individuals who thank Bernard Schwartz for his contribution and commitment to public service. Bernard's legacy of success in the private sector and commitment and generosity in the public sector should be a template to all of us in business. I have been asked to comment as someone from the business sector on how a national infrastructure bank could work. However, as someone who manages risks for a living, I'm going to do something rather risky for a businessman and venture briefly into the world of public policy to comment on this country's infrastructure policy. It is essential to keep in mind that an infrastructure bank is only a means by which the United States would implement a policy that encourages and increases direct investment in rebuilding and expanding the nation's infrastructure. Before any discussion about a bank can begin, our nation's policymakers have to agree that it is essential to access private investment for public infrastructure. This ideally should be done in a genuine partnership between state and local governments and the private investment community. A good example of such a partnership, as Representative DeLauro knows, is the investment that our fund made through a partnership with the state of Connecticut to renovate and upgrade the 23 rest stops on the principal highways in Connecticut. This partnership shifts the risk of the renovation, both cost and schedule, to the private sector, yet allows for an ongoing sharing of revenues from the project with the state over the next 35 years, as well as creating new union jobs within the state. I make this point because the federal government must lead the way in rewarding innovation. States and local leaders around the nation are willing to, to form these partnerships, and that has not yet been done. The bank would be one manifestation of that federal leadership, yet it is only a manifestation of a much deeper policy commitment to involve the private sector, which should be exemplified in several ways. This is a critical threshold issue because it involves important policy issues like performance standards in infrastructure projects, the management of risk, the integrity of data used to choose which projects to be funded, and several other issues that Congress and the administration must reform. Without these things being done, a national infrastructure bank would not only be unworkable, I submit 
that it would be harmful as it would be providing projects to a system in which infrastructure financing policy is fatally flawed. So how do I see the bank working? I think a good model is in fact that there is one in Europe, the European Investment Bank, better known as the EIB. Fundamentally, the EIB lends money or makes grants. Sorry, it, this is an important point. It lends money or makes guarantees. It does not hand out grants. These loans and guarantees are expected to be repaid or extinguished. It lends money for a very long term, as much as 40 years, at very low rates of interest, and in doing so, provides a level of subordinated capital that allows other participants, both banks and the private sector investors, to participate in a project that otherwise would be seen as unfundable. The lending policy of the EIB is driven by government, but the actual credit decisions on specific loans and guarantee proposals made to the bank are determined by professionals who come from a banking background or credit background and operate independently within the bank. Let me finish by underscoring an important point. There are several, there are significant private funds, including Carlyle's, looking to invest globally in infrastructure. The United States is competing for these funds with other countries that actually welcome private capital. The United Kingdom, Australia, Brazil, to name a few. Other governments have mechanisms and institutions that support public-private partnerships, both from a policy and a financing perspective. I have talked about one such institution being the EIB as a model for the National Infrastructure Bank in the United States. Everyone has agreed America's infrastructure is in bad shape as in, and is in need of rebuilding. And virtually everybody agrees that there should be some way to leverage the private sector capital into the system to help accomplish this. Whilst this is not a silver bullet to solve America's infrastructure challenges, I do firmly believe that establishing a national infrastructure bank is a smart, much needed, and excellent first step. Thank you. Mr. Spanager. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, while the others have focused a lot on the micro issues of how the bank would work, I'm going to talk briefly about how the bank would work to enhance our larger macro picture. And I simply want to make three points. First, expanded infrastructure investment made possible in part by a bank. Uh, would help us avoid, I think, a period. Okay, I will. A period of of subpar economic growth, stag growth, if you will, which is often associated with economies suffering after a post bubble burst, uh, post bubble economy. Uh, at the current pace of private sector deleveraging. We're still looking at five to seven years of high unemployment. Currently, we have 25 million Americans who are either unemployed or underemployed. That number is going to stay very high for the next uh, few, few years, given current trends. Second, it's just not a matter of jobs. It's a matter that there's a lot of idle capital. We have a period of very weak capital formation because there's not much incentives for private investment at this period. There's a lot of money on corporate balance sheets. There's a lot of money in various funds waiting to be de de deployed, even with the global competition for capital. That capital will need to be put to work over the next three to five years if we're going to avoid stag, stag growth. So the bank in this larger macro context can, with a, a relatively small amount of public capital, can put to w work a much larger amount, as, as the other panelists noted, of private capital to, <coughs> to support and finance growth-enhancing, growth-producing infrastructure projects that create jobs. We cannot overlook this fundamental challenge we face over the next three to five years to move from a growth rate of one to two percent to, to a growth rate of three to four percent at, uh, at the very least. The second point I want to make is that the infrastructure bank can finance a particular part 
of the, of the deficit that Brian outlined and that Tyler referred to. And, and this particular part of the infrastructure deficit has an outsized effect on economic growth and job creation, I would, would argue. These are infrastructure improvements and projects that tend to fall between the cracks of public and private. They tend to fall outside, even with the new, some of the new Department of Transportation programs that Tyler mentioned. Many of them fall outside either of federal appropriations or other federal grant or loan programs, fall outside the municipal bond market. These are projects like modernization of our inland waterways, anything dealing with our air transportation shipment, anything dealing with freight and rail, anything dealing with energy transmit, transmission, particularly natural gas terminals and pipelines. All of these projects would have an outsized uh, result or effect on jobs and growth. The third point I want to make, and it's probably the most controversial, is that the infrastructure bank <coughs> will assist in easing the dilemma the United States faces in dealing with the debt overhang and the, the management of the, both the debt and the dollar in the, peri in the period it hit. Not only for the reasons that Michael Lukoski has, has alluded to, but for another reason. As a principal reserve currency economy of the dollar, and given the state of the European Union, the state of other potential uh, currencies, uh, uh, potential reserve currencies in the world, for the next 10 years, the United States is still going to have either the privilege or the burden of providing or generating liquidity and safe assets for the world. This inevitably means some kind of deficits. Now, the last decade, we provided a, a host of very unsafe assets in terms of mortgage-backed securities. <clears throat> so <clears throat> we need to handle this. So the, the debate is somewhat misleading now on fiscal consolidation. Fiscal consolidation may be important for other reasons over a period of time. But one of the main challenges the United States has over the next, I would argue, three to five years or five to seven years is that it needs to produce good investments, both for domestic and international capital, that, that also enhance, however, ones that also enhance the U.S. productive growth and, and economic strength. And this is where infrastructure investment is so key, because infrastructure investment in a bank can produce quality, credit-worthy investments that are attractive to domestic and international capital in two ways. One, <clears throat> either because the bank can issue its own capital, which is not the case with the build, but is the case with some other models, or because it can provide loan guarantees for uh, issuance of pro specific project bonds, it can satisfy and provide a huge, uh, huge, <clears throat> it can satisfy a huge demand and a growing demand for quality fixed income investments over the next three to five years. There's two demographic trends that are currently underway. No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's not Medicare and Social Security. There's two demographic trends that makes fixed in a, a growth in the supply of fixed con income investments very necessary. One is the fact is that the baby boom generation is now moving to a med medium age of 57. They're moving from an investment strategy of risky equity investments to putting more money into fixed income that generates income for for uh, at a safer, safer risk. Therefore, we do not have that, those kinds of investment in su sufficient supply for the next three to, three to five, five years. The mortgage market has dried up. Treasuries will continue to yield very low 
levels of return. Second, infrastructure improvements will actually generate a number of other very positive investments that the U.S. can supply to the capital markets because infrastructure investments, as others allude to, increase the efficiency of private capital, they enhance the value, they make possible other projects and investments. So a small amount of public infrastructure investment produces a multiplier effect of other investments which will attract capital both domestic and internationally. And this is going to be the name of the game over the next three to five years of whether the U.S. can provide good investments for both domestic and international investors. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I want to get to the audience for questions as soon as possible, but let me throw uh, one or two out there myself um, to begin with. Uh, obviously, uh, a theme here is, you know, how this would really work. Uh, and let's drill down on that uh, a little bit. Uh, Tyler referred to it, the problem of uncertainty. Uh, Michael was, was talking about uh, a reputation here in this country for not doing public-private uh, partnerships well. And indeed, uh, to the extent that there is uh, a great deal of ideological resistance here in Washington to such an idea, uh, it is uh, in part because of this. Uh, people think of, uh, you know, what ended in disaster, the public-private partnership in housing, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Supporters of this idea, you know, would point to uh, other models, for example, the uh, Export-Import Bank, uh, which has been deemed largely successful. Uh, Robert uh, uh, mentioned the, uh, the EIB as a model. Um, let's talk about that uh, a little bit. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing, uh, for example, from Tyler or Michael, uh, whether you think uh, that should be the model, whether there is some other model, uh, so that uh, you know, we can, uh, in, in moving forward and on, on an idea like this, I mean, uh, frankly, this is a country that perceives the need for a successful model uh, beyond uh, where we've been in the last few years in the housing market. Tyler? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, the EIB definitely is kind of functioning well. I think the key element of that that, that is kind of lost in the U.S. is the credibility of the institution to make these fact-based decisions. And the U.S. government, lots of governments in the U.S. Uh, don't have a lot of credibility. I mean, all of the conversation about the bridge to nowhere and other major resource allocation failures have, have really depressed public confidence in the ability of government institutions to make these decisions. So one of the fundamental objectives should be to restore that uh, and to really bring a fact base to these decisions. And and whether it's EIB, frankly, I would say most of the rest of the world that makes major capital intensive investments through government entities has figured out a way to build credibility in that process. Uh, we just have been unsuccessful in the U.S. at doing that. Michael? Yeah, I, guess I want to say uh, maybe something about, I think we have a tradition of doing these right, too, particularly in the infrastructure and energy sector, both the, in the recent couple, past couple of years somewhat, I'd say, but also um, the Roosevelt administration faced the same problem in 1937. You know, spent, they took out, there was a lot of public debt to get the first wave, um, and then they faced another, a double dip. And the idea was to embrace this model. You know, Eccles, uh, Mayor Eccles, the uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that, you know, unwise spending was spending for the other fellow. So it's exactly the approach we take to public spending right now. And what Morgenthau, the Treasury Secretary Roosevelt, did, they, started to use these quasi-public entities. And our quasi-public entities were public-private partnerships. The purpose was they were, as Roosevelt said about them, they were public entities clothed with private clothes. So they had the adaptability of a private sector enterprise. And, oh, yeah, sure. The, the quasi-public entities at their heyday were this. They were able to bring private capital to bear on public challenges, and they did so by recognizing that there had to be a public partner in the U.S. And I think that what we have had a trouble with in the last couple of years is recognizing that public-private partnerships need a public partner. And that I think we have to take more seriously. This is not going to be a coast, um, coast to build infrastructure. There has to be some serious public partner, and the infrastructure bank is part of it, but the success I'd say of the EIB and the Asian Development Bank and the XM Bank is what they do is they catalyze a larger market. So we don't, not all projects that are public-private partnerships are going to need the, a national bank. But a national bank starts to shift towards creating incentives on the part of state agencies to do these projects that they can do on their own, largely, often. 
And that's the real goal, is not just to see this as just a, just to see that a national bank as a catalytic bank, not only for private investment, but also for starting to grow and have a different approach towards an economy that we have had at our points of rapid growth. And there have been challenges, but we've dealt with those challenges, and I think we can learn from those challenges as well in how we've done it domestically as well. Robert, for the question. I mean, I just want to make two points on that. One. Um, it's important to understand that the policy of the EIB is not driven by the EIB. It's driven by the 27 governments which own the EIB. So if those governments decide that renewable energy is an important fact for the growth of the European economy, they will direct the EIB to look for projects in the renewable energy space or in the high-speed rail space or in the transportation space. Which projects get financed is not decided by the government but is decided by the professionals of inside the bank that do a rigorous credit analysis, come up with a scoring system, and make a recommendation to the investment committee and ultimately to the board, depending on the size of the project. That way, you get real credible projects financed, not, um, not projects which maybe would be beneficial to certain uh, proponents of the project. The other thing is that the EIB, as I was trying to... Um, articulate, provides a le level of capital which will make a project financeable by the private sector, which, if it was not there, would not be financeable. So just imagine you have a project, I don't, you imagine whatever you want, and if the person that was going to invest in the project knew that an institution was going to provide 40-year long-term capital at a very low rate of interest, then that would attract banks who would then put bank debt on top of it, and it would attract institutions like myself or CalPERS or other big pension funds that would then put in their capital as well. This is happening all over the world. It's not happening here, and it needs to happen. I, and I'm just curious whether any of the panelists uh, takes issue in any way with the specifics uh, of the Kerry Hutchinson uh, legislation uh, as it stands. I think the basic idea is, you know, with an initial uh, tranche of, say, 10 million in public financing, uh, you could leverage that up to, to better than $600 billion uh, in, uh, in private investment over the years. Uh, does that seem workable under the terms of the, uh, of the legislation that, as it's put forward? Anyone have any thoughts on that? I'm, not, I'm definitely not commenting on a specific provision. I think the biggest challenge, though, is, is getting viable projects to market. I mean, the, the time frame and the complexity of bringing projects to market in the U.S. is a huge impediment to building anything new. So, I mean, I think in the near term, the recapitalization of the existing infrastructure, which requires a lot less complicated processes to get to a yes, uh, is going to have to be a focus. So, I mean, I, people should expect that it will take a lot, a long time to ramp up kind of the new project component of this entity. Uh, but I, I do think there needs to be part, this needs to be part of this long, longer term conversation about why are our processes so difficult relative to other countries. Okay. Uh, with that, Thank let's you. open it up to the audience. Uh, questions, please just uh, raise your hand and uh, please... Uh, Make sure that uh, there's a question mark uh, at the end of whatever it is you say. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, there's a microphone on, your, on its way over to you. Uh, thank you all for, for outlining some of the, the policy uh, proposals and the, the pitfalls that, that could be there. Uh, this is a question, I guess, sort of specifically for you, Mr. Dove, since you've spoken to some of the specifics of running uh, a bank such as this. You, you said that the governments involved in the EIB are able to set some of the policy direction of the projects they choose. It, it seems like having crumbling infrastructure and high unemployment are two things that should pretty much cancel each other out. You have the, an available workforce to do the projects if the projects are available. Would making the impact on unemployment a criteria for project selection be feasible? Would it be possible for a bank to look at something and say, X number, it will produce X number of man hours, need X number of, of resources produced by other companies. Would that be something that an infrastructure bank would be able to do? I think that could well be part of the policy, that um, you're looking to improve em employment. But I would just say that any infrastructure project funded either by the bank or by the private sector or by governments generates jobs. And that's one of the 
the fundamental reasons why we need to get more infrastructure funding in this country is it will create jobs. I mean, my little project in Connecticut, I'm not dismissing it, it's a, it's a tremendously good project and very important for the state of Connecticut, that did create nearly 100 new union jobs in that state. Would it have been done otherwise? Maybe, but I don't think so. So, yes, I think it could be a criteria, uh, but it shouldn't be the sole criteria. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, there seem to be, have been a few points made about national policy or lack thereof. Are we at this point, and this is the panel I would like to see how they respond, are we at this point sufficiently advanced where we think there is enough of a debate that we can have as a start for a national policy to overcome the resistance that we have seen in this country to typically having infrastructure tied in with just the jobs but not the economic development directly at times. Second point, even in the Asian countries, uh, China India, and I mean, India, we have seen that infrastructure seems to have hit a hurdle in the second phase wherein the pressure for land and other resources from the public has created resistance that some of the major projects have been stopped dead. Thank you. Um, interesting question on the debate and whether resistance yeah, can be overcome. I guess I'll, I'll start, and, and ASCE and, and some other groups hosted a summit a few weeks ago, and I think one of the things that came out of that discussion that we had was uh, when we're trying to address this infrastructure problem and how we change the conversation. Um, and I really think one of the things that came out of it was there was a study done recently, the Rockefeller Foundation commissioned a poll right after the State of the Union address. And it was, it was fascinating in, in its results. Um, at one point, you know, at some point we could say the American public understands there's a problem. Some, somewhere around 70% of the people claim there's an, in, or agree that there's an infrastructure problem. Uh, and I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but in the high 70s that they say there's an infrastructure problem. The dilemma that we face is when they were posed solutions to some of those problems, and this was specifically on transportation, and ways in which to fund the solutions, some of them which are, are pretty well known, you could raise the gas tax, you could have a vehicle miles traveled tax, you could have increased tolling. Da hands down, they rejected those by the same percentages, 70%, 65%. Um, and, and I guess the, the dilemma that we face is educating the public that this stuff is not free. Um, our infrastructure is not free, and in fact, the fact that we haven't invested in it is costing each and every one of us money every single day, whether it's stuck in traffic, whether it's boil water alerts, whether it's flooding on the Mississippi River. Uh, these things do cost money, and I actually think at the end of the day, um, watching this and, and thinking a little bit more about this, what the American people really want is leadership on this issue and people to stand up, like the folks who've stood up and talked about the infrastructure bank uh, and, and others, to stand up and say, these are the solutions and we're going to solve this problem. And I think at that point, if we lay those things out and explain to, to folks how we solve the problems, then, then we can proceed. So that, that's a perspective. Any other thoughts, Michael? Yeah. I, I just say that one of the... I, First, we're dealing with huge challenges right now in D.C. and all around the country, right? We've, had, from coming off of the, the, uh, the war, from having a financial crisis, having to deal with deficits in the, in the political environment. So I think that it's not, we're going to have, it's not, these are hard challenges that we're facing, and this is part of, is, is a part of that package. I'd say one of the things that the advantage of, of introducing these, this proposal and public-private partnerships into the debate right now um, that makes them I have more. I think are going to have more traction and have more resonance. Is that these are approaches that are suited to dealing with solving how to bring money into infrastructure in the context of a deficit crisis. Our other solutions on the table simply aren't right. They're, they're, they're discussions that we're used to having, and we're and they haven't gone particularly well. So the idea of bringing an additional pot of private capital to bear on the problem um, without the public debt taking involved, why the public can delever their balance sheets, is provides a solution that we that's being posed in a very concrete terms right now around the deficit debate. So I think that that's I think one of the reasons why this 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 
proposal is one that's a little bit, that has some, um, there's some payoff and it is a little bit more addressed to the problem that we're posing right now as a society. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, I, I think we're getting close to a policy consensus. We're a long way off from a political consensus. And I think as a result, we need a lot more experimentation. I mean, right now, there just aren't enough on the ground experiments where people can feel comfortable that the data, you know, we, we have not translated yet from a rhetorical versus data fight. We're still in the rhetoric versus rhetoric fight. That's kind of the early stages of uh, policy uh, progressive progression. And I think we just need more on the ground experiments. And I think one of the great powers of any entity that finances infrastructure projects is they can provide you know evidence we just don't have enough real world evidence we do around the world but Americans tend to dismiss other countries experiences in these areas so. <laughs> yes sir um, John Nelson with Wall Street without walls uh, one particular model might be the UK the social investment bank uh, sir Ronald Cohen who serves on our advisory board who utilized, uh, un underutilized assets held by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, abandoned bank accounts, for example, as credit enhancements. We have vacant lots. We have all kinds of underutilized federal and state and city assets that could be used as extra collateral for the bank. Do you see this kind of model adding on underutilized collateral as a way of f helping to finance through a structured finance mechanism some of the uh, infrastructure bank ideas? I think the, um, that is an interesting idea. Um, remember, in the UK, you have central government and central treasury functions. So the city of Birmingham really can't do anything. This is the city of Birmingham in the UK, can't do anything, whereas the city of Birmingham, Alabama, has a lot more power than the city of Birmingham in the UK. So that central government role actually does allow for things that you're talking about happening. Um, I can tell you that in the UK right now, the fiscal problems are dire. And one of the things which is happening is that the central government is telling municipalities, if you own infrastructure assets, you should sell them and get money from the private sector or enter into some partnerships. So you'll find that you know, regional airports or, or car parking or whatever it is will be coming on the block and there will be an opportunity for me to invest in that. Whereas I'd like to try and invest in that same situation here in the United States. Cheryl? Yeah, I, I want to underscore one of the points that Robert Dove made in his presentation. Because I, yes, I, I want to underscore one of the points that Robert Dove made in his, his presentation because I think it points to the model that, that um, the Kerry Hutchinson bill moves towards and and that will work in the American context. As I understand it, there's a there's large number of private funds that have been accumulated over the last three to five years to, to, to uh, invest in the next big thing in terms of the infrastructure boom. But many of these projects actually do require some public sector participation of one kind or another. I see a lot of low-hanging fruit out there for projects that are just waiting for the kind of public sector loan guarantees or participations that that uh, that the Build Act or or other versions would would put put forward, that that actually do whether it's modernization of inland waterways that have immediate fees and, and returns attached to them, or the kind of projects that that Robert talked about. So there, there is a, an American model out there and waiting that I think actually has enough practical experience. What has been missing is this fairly modest but yet very powerful impact of having this public center, sector entity of, of unleashing some of all that money that, that Robert Dove and others are setting on. Uh, we'll take a few more questions while we're waiting for Senator Kerry. Uh, the gentleman here, the white-haired gentleman right here. <laughs> I'm Charles Hoke with the white hair. Thank you. <laughs> with white hair comes wisdom, but I don't, I don't claim it. Uh, I was particularly interested in the responses of all five gentlemen. I guess we are all interested in Mr. Dubb's pot of money, just alluded to. Uh, I am a Virginian by rearing. Your reference to the project in Connecticut 
and you mentioned, I think, three times, I sort of recollected, uh, the, the making or the creation of union jobs. I mentioned my heritage as a Virginian uh, because we are right to work in Virginia, and we are wondering if, I would wonder, not we, uh, I would wonder if projects criteria for the Carlisle Group would impose union membership uh, for any project that you would underwrite. Thank you. Our investment policy does not specifically say that we um, need to create union jobs. It doesn't say that we need to create any jobs. Um, but I would like to make it very clear that on two things. One, you would be surprised to know, and I cannot for confidentiality reasons reveal who they are, but we have several union pension funds actually invested in our fund because they want to see their workers' money going into infrastructure projects. Secondly, we have a policy whereby we recognize unions and we support the right for unions to work and we do not go out of our way one way or another. The important thing for me is to find good projects with good returns for my investment, my investors. Well, thank you uh, so much. I see Senator Kerry is here. So with that, we will end the first phase of the program. Thanks so much uh, to a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. I want to thank the panel. Uh, I want to thank Michael Hirsch. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, for those, uh, we have many, many people watching online now. I want to again uh, reiterate my thanks to the uh, staff members. There's so many cool staff members on Senator Kerry's staff, but getting this room uh, was among the best things that, the, that, that, that we've had uh, done for us. We're very, very pleased to have it here. Um, our uh, uh, supporter of this event, Bernard Schwartz, has joined us this morning uh, as well. And I'm going to say just a couple of quick words. For those of you who don't know, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm both senior fellow and founder of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, but I'm new, the new um, Washington editor-at-large of The Atlantic, and The Atlantic uh, is sponsoring today's forum. And it's a great uh, pleasure to have you all of us with you. Uh, us to be with you. Uh, Bernard Schwartz. Bernard Schwartz is sort of like DC's Medici. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. You know, Bernard uh, has been a member of the board of the New America Foundation for a very long time. He is, but, but there are so many people in this room, not just because we're talking about infrastructure, we want you to take it very seriously, but there are many people who've been uh, assisted by Bernard's commitment to a healthy civil society uh, across many spectrums. Uh, Bernard uh, has been, uh, has endowed programs at the Paul Nitze School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins, the graduate faculty at the New School University, the Council on Foreign Relations. I know I saw Mike Tomaski in here before. Uh, Mike has been editor until recently of uh, the Democracy Journal. Um, I saw, um, oh he's still, excuse me, that and he's Daily Beast's latest pundit. So. Uh, uh, there we've got Will Marshall who's in the room and so Will's uh, work with the DLC on many fronts I know that Bernard has been supportive of but whether it's technology and civil society Bernard has been there and he's played just a key element of course he's chairman of BLS investments former chairman of the board and CEO of Laurel space and communications but he's become tenaciously committed to this notion that the United States needs to do something about the backbone of its infrastructure to make sure that the economy is creating recurring returns for the public for generations uh, from the investments that we can make today. So without further ado, let me invite Bernard Schwartz up to make a few comments and to introduce our very honored uh, keynote speaker. Uh, Bernard. The reason I'm in favor of infrastructure is because I need some financing to uh, do surgery during my left knee. <clears throat> and also, for those of you who know that I was late today, it's a demonstration of why we need infrastructure in Washington. It's to, follow, to do something about the traffic problem. But my purpose here today is to thank you all for coming here. This is an important and big crowd. Uh, I welcome that because this is an important and big subject. And unless we get our hands around it, the United States will not be a first-rate country, and we deserve to be a first-rate country. 
Um, I want to thank very much the Atlantic, uh, uh, the Atlantic for being co-sponsor here um, and for New America Foundation for being a co-sponsor as well. Um, their efforts have been very, very good. I want to congratulate Steve Clemens, uh, who is uh, now going to have an important job in Atlantic. Um, and we are going to be holding on to him as much as possible because he is a, an important resource. Today, um, I am absolutely um, privileged uh, to mention some of our co-sponsors here as well. Senators Kerry, Senator, Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison, Senator Warner, Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, Congress Lady um, Rosa DeLauro, are all people who have been deeply involved in this subject for a very long period of time. And they continually to focus on this important issue. The time is now. The people out there who need jobs, who can be employed in an infrastructure program, who have been unemployed for an average of three months, uh, nine months, uh, this is a critical problem for this country but also is a critical problem, the fact that we have an infrastructure that does not work in this country, and we are one of the few countries in the modern industrial world that does not have an infrastructure that is capable to progress our society. We need to solve that problem. We need to solve it now. Senator John Kerry has been particularly uh, involved with this problem not because he doesn't have other things to do. <laughs> uh, the senator is uh, uh, chair of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, he's a member of the F uh, Finance Committee. Uh, he has been involved in every key uh, important issue of this country for a very long period of time. The important thing about Senator Kerry is his focus on those issues that are most important to this country and his ability not just to focus on the problem, but to come up with solutions that are practical and workable. And we have one of those things here today, and his comments are going to be particularly worthwhile listening to and hearing. I want to thank the panel that preceded me. Uh, each of them had brought something very, very special, um, and um, it is exactly that kind of effort that's going to bring this to a head today. Um, the fact is that this is a, um, a problem whose time has come. We can do something about it. And I'm very, very privileged to introduce Senator Kerry uh, to speak to you here today. Senator Kerry. <laughs> Well, Bernard, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your introduction. Thank you for, most importantly, uh, your extraordinary leadership on this. Uh, uh, Bernie has been, uh, get settled here, guys. Uh, Bernie has really been just unbelievable in his uh, commitment to trying to help make something happen with respect to infrastructure. And he's put enormous personal resources on the line help to bring people to the table and together with Steve Clemens they have been uh, doing the best of what this country and this city needs right now which is actually uh, thinking uh, a little bit of thought and uh, uh, it's sort of stunning to me that we are where we are but we are um, I last night was privileged to honor Ted Stevens uh, at, uh, for his work on fisheries and oceans, which I had also been deeply involved in over the years. I used to be chairman of the Ocean Subcommittee. Ted Stevens and I rewrote the America's Fisheries Laws, Magnuson Act. This is complete diversion, but it has a point. Uh, and he and, uh, Ted, he and uh, Danny Inouye on the Defense Appropriations Act were enormous partners through the years. Whether one was chairman or one was ranking absolutely didn't matter. They treated each other with the same respect and worked in the same way and as a result got an enormous amount done, including uh, their support for oceans research, science, uh, 
some of the things that we needed to do. But, but there was a huge partnership there. That's what we need here in this city right now. That's what we need in this country in order to get our country back on track. And that is why this infrastructure conference is so important. I'm grateful to the Atlantic uh, for sponsoring it uh, and uh, for all of you for caring enough to come and sort of think about this and begin to apply ourselves in a way that can really help us address multiple problems. The approach that we are talking about with respect to infrastructure is not a pie in the sky, off the wall, hastily thrown together concept. Some of us, Rosa DeLero is here uh, in the House, have been, she's been a leader on this, working on it for a number of years. Chris Dodd, when he was here, was working on it over the Senate with a bunch of us. It's been through a number of iterations. And what we have settled on in the Senate now is really a very different uh, approach from anything that we've had previously. I happen to think, because we have really worked on it about as hard as I've worked on anything here with a diligent staff who spent an enormous amount of time traveling to England, sitting with folks there, uh, talking to them, to Luxembourg, elsewhere, Europe, looking at the European Infrastructure Bank, looking at what's happening in China, really evaluating it and measuring it against our current politics, where obviously uh, the mood and willingness to try to create something with a federal charter that resembles Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac is going to be non-existent. And so dispel yourselves immediately of any notion that this has any resemblance to those. It is not for profit, they are for profit. It does not issue stock, they issue stock. It is fully independent from the federal government, they are not so fully independent, and from politics. So there are huge distinctions that we have drawn on specifically to preempt the potential opposition that might exist to doing something with respect to this. Now, I, I really get passionate about this. I get genuinely excited because it matters so much to us. Infrastructure is not a luxury. Infrastructure is not something you do because you, you know, have extra money lying around or because you want to create a work program or a jobs program. Infrastructure is the core of your economy around which the ability of people to get to work, to get home, to be productive, about around which the capacity to move goods from place of manufacture to the marketplace, whether it's a marketplace domestically or a marketplace abroad, your ability to do that is enhanced as a consequence of your infrastructure. Over this past weekend, I was in, uh, uh, I was in London to meet with uh, officials with respect to Afghanistan, military officials, political officials, as we think about where we're heading there. I then had been invited to go to uh, Normandy to speak at the D-Day commemoration uh, exercises. And I had the pleasure of getting on a train in downtown, midtown London, and two hours later getting off a train in downtown, midtown Paris, from center to center in two hours and 15 minutes, with my cell phone plugged in, my computer plugged in, capacity to talk to people, get work done, eat a meal, and not go through half the trouble that it takes to get to an airport, wait to take off, be delayed on the tarmac, have weather problems, ultimately get where you're going, and then face a taxi ride or whatever to try to get to where you're going for another 45 minutes to an hour. And this is a train that doesn't go remotely as fast as the TGV or the bullet train or China's new trains, uh, which are the future. But not the future for the United States, folks, on the road we're on, the path we're on, hardly a road. The fact is that uh, we just, we're, in a, we're stuck. We're in a strange place, and we have to break out of this place because it matters for our ability to compete. It matters for the quality of life in our country. It matters for the type of lifestyle people will live, and it matters for our ability to be able to grow our economy and provide people the kind of strength we want in the future. And I'll tell you this, as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, 
It matters for our ability to be able to have credibility in talking with leaders in other parts of the world who look at the United States and wonder whether we have the ability or the commitment and the steadfastness and, and purpose of doing anything. We can't even get a budget. And they look at us and say, you tell us you're going to do this. They, they doubt us. There's a real doubt about the United States right now. Believe it or not, this infrastructure bank that I am proposing is related to this notion of how you address the concerns people have about all those kinds of things that I just talked about. Now, why is it important? Well, folks, <laughs> we have gone from first in the world to 23rd in the world. 23rd, we are now ranked according to the World Economic Forum, in the quality of our infrastructure. Ports, roads, harbors, bridges, tunnels, airports, trains, all of the components of the things that move people, goods, and products and define uh, the infrastructure of our country. If you talk to the main cadre of engineers, architects, uh, experts who work for states and federal government who are responsible for keeping our infrastructure at par, they will tell you, without regard to political label, that the United States has a $2.2 trillion deficit in infrastructure. It would take $250 billion a year, each year, for the next 40 years, just to bring our roads infrastructure up to par. That's without even addressing airports and other qualities. Now, most of you in this room and, and many of you listening have traveled, traveled perhaps profusely, I don't know. But I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's depressing to me to travel today and get out at an airport in another country and sort of look around you at the architecture, at the cleanliness, at the signage, at the capacity to move easily from ramp to public transportation, at the ability to be able to actually get your luggage. I mean, you get out at our airports, and if you're a foreign traveler and you haven't yet gotten American currency, you have no prayer of getting a cart to take your baggage from where you are to, to, to out, because the money exchanges are all on the other side of the customs, and the carts all have to be paid for. And so, I mean, we just, we aren't connecting any of the dots for how you make things work for people. That's a minor example. I rode on the high-speed rail from Beijing to Tianjin the other day. A uh, 29-minute trip that used to take about 8 to 10 hours. A 29-minute trip. And when I got in, they put me up in the engineer's car, a beautiful little you know, seat, a table, they fold the table down. Guy puts a glass of water in front of me on the table. And I get very nervous. I'm used to riding Amtrak. I say, no, take that away. You know, I'm, I don't want that in my lap. The guy said, no, 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 don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. I swear to God, folks, we're going 200 miles an hour, leaving all of the traffic in the dust, and the water is barely moving in the glass. Now, we're fighting to just keep Amtrak alive. Amtrak, the Acela which is a train that has the ability to go 150 miles an hour, and guess what? You know how many miles of the trip from Washington to New York it goes, 150 miles an hour? 18 miles of the whole trip. Why? Because if it goes too fast under the Baltimore Tunnel, the vibrations may cave in the tunnel, and we don't have the sufficient capacity for the tunnel. Because if you go too fast over the bridges over the Chesapeake, they're not reinforced for that kind of speed, and the train will wind up in the Chesapeake. Uh, you know, this, this is the United States of America. I mean, we're the country that did go to the moon. We're the country that invented solar technology, invented wind technology, and we're behind in all of them. We don't have one country in the top ten in the world today because we don't invest, because we're not smart about thinking about the future. We're living off our parents' and our grandparents' investments in the infrastructure of our country. Brooklyn Bridge, MBTA in Boston, Interstate Highway System, Eisenhower. Tell me, where are the great infrastructure projects of our generation? What have we built for the future? And of course, we're, we're, we're really so 
lacking in, in sort of vision that we don't even have a capital budget in the United States of America, so it's all current accounts. We pay for it as we go. So the current generation has to sit down and pay for infrastructure that's going to be used 100 years from now. But it's all against the current budget, rather than a real capital budget like most companies in the world who do capital expansion, particularly when they can be revenue producing. Now here are the stark facts. China is investing 9% of its GDP into infrastructure today. Europe is investing 5% of its GDP into infrastructure today. Over the last three years, they put about $350 billion into infrastructure. Brazil put about $240 billion over the last three years alone. And the United States is piddling amounts of money that come through, you know, FIFIA or water or iced tea or one of the programs or another, but it's minor. We're even running out of money in the transportation trust fund, in the highway trust fund. So what are we going to do, folks? Are we going to sit here and tell the American people that we are incapable of planning and thinking ahead and being visionaries who put together a program to be able to build America? Are we just going to decline and walk away? I don't think, I hope not. I pray we're not. Now, in this current budget mood, with this particular Congress, we're not going to see big appropriations to build in America. You know it. We're just not going to see big appropriations. The Appropriations Committee is struggling right now. No earmarks, no this, no that, which incidentally is one of the dumbest things I ever heard of in my life. It, it, I think Americans are not objecting to, uh, to an earmark that goes through a committee that's been properly vetted, that people have had hearings on, that is voted on, that then goes to the floor and is properly decided on. That's the job of Congress. What they object to are midnight deals where pet projects that never saw the light of day and never were vetted and never were voted on are shoved in at the last minute. But typically, overreact, throw the baby out with the bathwater. The result is, our ability to target bridges, our ability to do specific projects has now been stripped away from us, at least for this year, till people come to their senses, I hope. So how are we going to build America? Every day, yesterday, you heard Bernanke. Fragile recovery, not creating enough jobs. What are we going to do, Just sit on our hands? Every billion dollars you put into infrastructure is 18,000 jobs. You want to build America? You actually put people to work. You not only put people to work, you put people to work in jobs that stay here, and you can structure this in a way that you guarantee that you're building out America's manufacturing base and America's economy uh, at the same time with, by making sure you buy certain kinds of American products and so forth. I believe that this concept of the bank is a thing that's ripe, and I want to ask every one of you in whatever your channel of communication is that brings you here today to enlist in this effort to get this done this year. Now, what is it? It is a bank, unlike the administration's proposal, which goes to the Department of Transportation, scores at $30 billion, has about $15 billion worth of grants. Now, grants are fine. I've usually supported them. But I don't think we're going to pass grants in this particular Congress. So we don't have grants in our proposal. We just have loans. And we have loans that are based on an absolute normal marketplace uh, set of standards by an independent entity. We are not setting up a government entity. It's an independent bank that will have appointed directors, all of whom must be confirmed by the Senate based on their professional background and capacity uh, to be able to uh, live up to the highest standards of fiduciary responsibility and of infrastructure investment loans. Now, the loans are for three categories. Uh, there's a recent proposal that a couple of my colleagues put in. It only is for transportation. It only goes to uh, through the transportation department. We don't want it to be within a department, I think. We want it outside of the politics. We want it to be independent. We want it to be inscrutable with respect to the standards that are applied to it. And the way to do that is through the independent entity, which is what we judged based on what was happening in Europe and elsewhere works best. We also then leverage 
private investment. Our lending goes to three categories, transportation, energy, and water. Those projects would be $100 million or more, except for rural, where we have a 5% set aside for the rural communities with a specific rural assistance ability, because some rural communities may not be that practiced and versed in how they apply or put together the kind of deal. Uh, but they would then apply for a revenue-producing loan, i.e. a project where there's a toll, there's cost, to say, electricity, therefore people are paying something, and there's a revenue stream. And our project, our bill, bill scores at only $10 billion. We've worked very closely with CBO. It's structured so we kept it as inexpensive as possible, as little outlay as necessary. That outlay translates into anywhere from 340 to $640 billion of leveraged investment into American infrastructure through pension funds, sovereign funds, bond state funds, et cetera, that have the ability. Anybody can apply, individual, corporation, state, joint venture, and so forth, but because they have to meet the standards of the deal. And the deal is one that pays back to the American taxpayer. In the end, <coughs> this would work <coughs> not unlike the Export-Import Bank, which since 1991 has been making a profit. It makes a profit. And we expect this infrastructure bank to actually make money, be self-sustaining over time, though it's not profit-making. So that money would go back out into leveraging more lending and leveraging more building. Now money, as everybody here knows, is fungible. If we don't do this, folks, those pension funds and those sovereign funds are not going to sit on the sidelines and say, gee, the United States isn't letting us do something with our money, so we won't do anything. Uh-uh. They're going to go look for the greatest return, safest return, or fastest return, or some combination of the three on investment. And they're going to find it in Brazil, in India, in China, in Korea, in Mexico, in a lot of other places. So this is the time for the United States of America to kind of get going, to wake up and recognize that this is the way we can uh, you know, really change the economy of our country, change the direction of our country, improve the quality of life for people, uh, put America back on track to developing those trains that can go faster, the technologies we could sell to other countries. Right now, we'll have to go to Germany and Japan and China and other places to get a lot of this technology. That's kind of sad. But if we get into the game hard enough and fast enough, maybe we can get back into it and be the people producing these kinds of things. You have to invest. So anybody will tell you that. You have to invest to make money. And we have to invest to make our future. So I believe that uh, this is a self-sustaining entity that allows the U.S. government to do more with less. It is, in the final analysis, the only way the United States of America is going to get into the business of rebuilding ourselves. We did the Big Dig project up in Boston, great project. Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, myself worked on it hard, 1990s. You've got a project out here trying to connect out to uh, Dulles uh, with a rail system. Uh, I noticed the Virginia and some of the local communities trying to pull back from that because they don't have the money and they don't want to commit to it. Uh, we have governors giving back money. Uh, we're very happy in Massachusetts because we got an extra $795 million for the Northeast thanks to the lack of vision in the governor of uh, Florida and thanks to the lack of vision in the governor of New Jersey and the governor of Ohio uh, who can't uh, see the value of this kind of long-term investment. Uh, so we will benefit and our people will benefit and the country will benefit as a result of that. But we can do this cheaper, we can do this faster, we can do this more effectively if we create this independent entity of the infrastructure bank, and I ask all of you to do as much as you can to try to help uh, support it and make it happen this year, this is the best way to get our economy moving again. Thank you very much. Senator Kerry, thank, thank you very much.
I was telling Senator Kerry's staff that he might do a double take uh, when he saw me this morning, because I'm usually dealing with him on foreign policy and national security issues. But since he straddles both the Senate Finance Committee and, of course, is chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I want to pose one question before he has to go. I read every word of the President's national security strategy, and the real takeaway from the national security strategy report was how much of that report was focused on the need to get the U.S. economy moving. It was a remarkable report in that sense, and I think really broke with many other reports. Admiral Mike Mullen uh, and the think tank that he has around there is focused on, as well, the U.S. economy. They keep it kind of quiet because they don't want to look like they're taking over everything uh, uh, from the Pentagon. But I do want to basically raise the question of, do you feel that the national security that there's a national security dimension to the, the presentation and support you've given the Infrastructure Bank? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I didn't want to divert, uh, you know, too far in this conversation, so I'm, I'm, I'm enormously appreciative for the, for the question. But um, our ability to do what we need to do to f I'll give you an example. Uh, a quarter of the Arab world lives in Egypt. The Arab Spring and the future of Egypt is very much up for grabs. Uh, nothing is certain. What I know is certain, uh, I was there a few weeks ago and spent two days in Cairo and did a town meeting and other things with people. I came away just laser beam focused on the notion that the only way to deal with Egypt right now is economic. Really, we ought to be doing a Marshall Plan for Jordan, Tunis, Tunisia, for uh, Egypt, etc. And we need to be doing more with respect to Pakistan, which is where most of the problem is coming that is affecting Afghanistan. And yet we're putting $120 billion into Afghanistan and only $2.8 billion into Pakistan. It doesn't make sense. But right now, if you went to the Appropriations Committee of either the House or Senate, their mood is not to put any money into these things. So everything is related to our economy. If we don't get our economy moving, folks, we will simply not have the wherewithal, the credibility, to be able to sustain the projection of values, principles, interests that we try to project with respect to our foreign policy. And so our national security is affected by that. If these rising powers like China and or others view us as getting weaker, not stronger, I guarantee you there'll be conflict somewhere, there'll be a reach, a grab for the South China Sea islands, for uh, oil, for other kinds of things as the demand for resources increases and our ability to protect our interests, not even just to leverage or to you know, project, but to protect our interests is diminished. So getting our economy moving again is critical. And right now, I, I, I just I worry that we've got some folks around here who just don't connect the dots. If we just go through rapacious cutting and eat America's seed corn in the process, and I mean by that, don't do infrastructure, reduce our commitment to science and technology and our research and development, reduce our commitment to education particularly, <coughs> if we diminish our ability to compete rather than grow it, I'll give you an example. We're now 12th in the world. We've slipped uh, from first and second again to 12th in the numbers of kids, 25 to 30 kids, number of people, 25 to 35 who graduate from college. 12th. That is going in exactly the wrong direction with respect to what we need to do to compete and keep our economy strong in an information-based, technology-based, high-value-added, job-based, economic competitive struggle. And so uh, doing all of these things is critical. Linked to infrastructure, the single most important thing we should do, and we frankly should have done two years ago, is energy. If we will unleash you know, America's entrepreneurial and creative skill into the energy market, we're looking at a $6 trillion market with 6 billion potential users today going up to about 10 billion, we read, in the next 40 years. The technology market that created the boom of the 1990s, which made everybody in America see their income go up. Every single quintile saw income go up. 
That was a $1 trillion market with 1 billion users. So here we are, staring in the face of infrastructure, energy, these huge economic opportunities for our country, which create jobs that have to stay here. You build a plant here that provides electricity here, the jobs stay here. And we're not doing it. We're not doing it. We missed this enormous opportunity last year on climate energy, basically because a bunch of great big coal companies that have fully depreciated and fully paid for their plants, and they are now cash cows, and they're sitting there reaping in the benefits while they pollute the atmosphere and kill the oceans and so forth. That's, that's why we lost it. It's why we're not doing this, folks. It's because, you know, Washington is stuck with too much money chasing politicians and, and, and too few places for Americans uh, to uh, feel that they have an opportunity to have their agenda addressed. Now, I know this is far-reaching and outside the vein, but believe me, it is related to why we don't do these things. It's because this place is managed and run and the agenda is set by very wealthy, targeted interests that have the ability to control what happens here, and we don't get a lot of things done that ought to be happening. Or, not always that, or people just don't choose to impact it. Like Bernie is impacting it. He's having an impact. He's choosing to put this vision on the line and try to make these things happen. Frankly, there's a hell of a lot more money to be made in the doing of those things than in just marrying the status quo. And that's what I hope we're going to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you uh, for your candor, Senator Kerry, and your leadership, uh, and also for this great room. Thanks for your staff's uh, leadership and support as well of this a Atlantic Forum. Uh, but let me just invite Rosa DeLauro to come share uh, some thoughts with us. Please give a hand to Rosa DeLauro. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all very, very much. Wow, what a, what a, what a crowd here on a... It must be because it's air conditioned here and no one wants to be outside here. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a delight to see you all. And Steve, thank you. It's great to be with all of you. And I want to say a thank you to the Atlantic and to the New America Foundation for inviting me uh, to come here uh, 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 today. And uh, uh, in the past decade, I will tell you that I have uh, come to rely on uh, the experts at the New America Foundation uh, for uh, unique valuable insights into the issues that are before us. So I thank them very, very much uh, for being here and for helping us to fight the good fight. Uh, I particularly want to say a thank you uh, to someone who's very dear to me, and that's Bernard Schwartz. Um, you have played such an unbelievable role, uh, a, a leadership role uh, at New America. You've provided invaluable counsel uh, to me in creating a national infrastructure bank uh, over the years. I rely on your advice and I rely on your counsel. Bernard has gone above and beyond the call of service uh, to this nation and its fellow citizens. So we are, uh, as Senator Kerry has pointed out, grateful uh, to him for uh, putting his time, his commitment and resources into something that is so critical uh, to, uh, to our future. I also want to say thank you to my colleagues, the Senators Kerry and Warner and Hutchinson, uh, who have taken up the standard of the Infrastructure Bank on the Senate side, and thank them uh, for their leadership. Uh, to the members of the panel today, I must tell you that I was making my way uh, uh, from uh, Connecticut, uh, leaving my house at 4.30 this morning uh, to, uh, to get to New York, to get here, uh, to be able to, to do it. So sorry I didn't hear the, uh, the opening salvo. Um, a National Infrastructure Bank uh, for America is an idea that I have been fighting for for over 15 years now. I introduced legislation in 1994. I'm not going to let it go. <laughs> I'm not going to let it go. I feel that we are in need of seeing this concept become a reality now more than ever. There are many reasons for this. Perhaps most importantly, we are now desperately in need uh, uh, to boost long-term job creation, economic growth, and the bank would provide that kind of growth. It can be the engine for economic growth in this, in this country. And I'd like to uh, quote to you uh, Ambassador Felix Rowetton, 
who was another great advocate of the infrastructure bank uh, that I want to talk to you about today. And his, he correctly noted in his book, Bold Endeavors, and I quote, American history shows that economic growth or creation of wealth, employment, and opportunity are all built on the platform of investment, innovative public investment. And in my view, in our country today, that key platform for economic growth is in very dangerous disrepair. Just a couple of statistics uh, for you. Um, Texas Transportation Institute. Traffic congestion creates an $87.2 billion annual drain on our economy in lost productivity and wasted fuel. In Baltimore, 5,000 water pipe breaks occurred in the last four years. EPA, $183 billion is needed for the installation and maintenance of safe drinking water systems through 2022. $202 billion required for publicly owned wastewater systems rela related infrastructure needs through 2024. Electricity, electric utilities will need to invest an annual average of $28 billion for generation, $12 billion for transmission, $34 billion for distribution of electricity to keep pace with demand. The United States is 15th in the world access to broadband. That is the state of disrepair. Last week's job report signifies that we have to take stronger action to create jobs, to grow the economy. We only added 54,000 jobs last month, and unemployment hovers above 9%. We all agree that these numbers are usually disappointing, although opinions differ on the reasons behind them. Speaker Boehner attributes them to overtaxing, and I quote, overregulating and overspending. It will not surprise you that I do not agree. President Obama has suggested these numbers are a bump on the road on the way to recovery. And Austin Goolsby, the chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, has also tried to accentuate the positive, while notably calling for an infrastructure bank over the weekend. I believe that the economy is still deeply struggling, that we cannot explain the poor numbers on short-term shocks, like the Japan earthquake, higher gas prices, and the turmoil in North Africa and the Middle East alone. We are facing an ongoing jobs and economic crisis in America today, and we have to act accordingly. We need to put people back to work, rebuild our nation, and restore the conditions for long-term prosperity. At this point, this is an even bigger issue than just stimulus or recovery. This is about whether or not America can grow, whether we can create jobs and compete with other economic power centers in the world. This is about the prospect of America continuing to produce middle-class jobs and middle-class incomes. Unfortunately, the House majority, despite their rhetoric last year, has chosen not to focus on job creation, economic growth, or American competitiveness at all. Instead, they want to slash a social safety net, repeal health care reform, neither of which will create jobs, much less restore the foundations of our national prosperity. That agenda is not going to get it done. We need to respond to this job crisis with a more forward-looking and comprehensive vision. And to me, that means investing in our infrastructure. In the 19th and the 20th centuries, infrastructure investments such as canals, railroads, public highway systems allowed our economy to grow, particularly in the manufacturing sector. We must now do the same with the 21st century infrastructure like high-speed rail, ports, clean energy transmission, and broadband. In the long term, we must move from an unbalanced, service-oriented economy to building a 21st century manufacturing capability so that we can once again create good jobs, skilled jobs, well-paying jobs that cannot be outsourced. Put another way, we need to go back 
to being a nation that builds things again, rather than one that consumes things that are made overseas. Diving deeper into last month's job report, construction and manufacturing employment were essentially unchanged in May. While manufacturing has added 243,000 jobs since its low point in December 2009, construction has changed little since early 2010, after falling sharply from 2007 to 2009. These are the jobs America needs to grow again. An infrastructure bank will make it happen. In fact, Dow Chemical CEO and President Andrew Laveris, in his book, Make It in America, argues that infrastructure investments are critical to creating a 21st century manufacturing sector. One, it creates a market for manufacturing products that are part of the infrastructure system. Two, it can allow us to operate more efficiently and cost effectively. And three, it can help our products reach deeper into emerging markets for less. That is why Laveris advocates for a national infrastructure bank. Pointing to the success of the European Investment Bank, he sees it as vital not only to founding significant pro uh, projects across America, but to the success of manufacturing and business in general. That is why the concept now enjoys support from across the spectrum, from the Chamber of Commerce to the labor community. Not normally happy bedfellows, because they understand that it will create jobs, it will promote business and manufacturing, and is desperately needed. According to a recent report from the Urban Land Institute, we have fallen behind three emerging economic competitors, Brazil, China, India, in terms of infrastructure investment. China has a plan to spend a trillion dollars on high-speed rail, highways, and other infrastructure in five years. India is nearing the end of a $500 billion investment phase that has seen major highway improvements and plans to double that amount by 2017. And Brazil plans to spend $900 billion on energy and transportation by 2014. The report concludes by reminding us of a grim fact that we have been hesitant to acknowledge. We need to invest $2 trillion just to get our roads, bridges, water lines, sewage systems, and dams in fair condition again. These investments may be necessary, but as you know, and as Senator Kerry pointed out, there is no appetite anywhere near this level in this institution at the moment. We are focused single-mindedly on reducing the deficit right now to the detriment of investments that we need, the kinds of investments that we need to remain competitive with other economic power centers around the world. And even if that were not the case, we simply will not be able to muster the level of investment that is needed through current financing mechanisms at the local, state, or federal level. And so we need to come up with innovative solutions to address the investment shortfall and restore the conditions for long-term prosperity in America. And that includes leveraging the hundreds of billions of dollars in private capital out there that are available for public investment. And again, as Senator Kerry said, if we don't take advantage of it, that money isn't going to hang around doing nothing. That's why I have fought to create a national infrastructure bank that is modeled structurally after the European Investment Bank. Like the EIB, the bank would be governed by an independent and objective board of directors that could, among other things, make final infrastructure financing determinations, an executive committee to handle day-to-day -day operations of the bank, a risk management and audit committee to carefully manage risk and to monitor the bank's activities. As I am sure many of you know, uh, the European Investment Bank has had a striking effect on Europe's uh, infrastructure projects. Last year, its total lending was 72 billion euros, or $100 billion uh, at US dollars, of which approximately 88% went to projects within Europe. The bank in my legislation would issue federal bonds 
at a rate determined by the Treasury Secretary and presumably slightly above the going Treasury rate on the capital markets. To institutional investors such as pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, other foreign investors to invest in the bank and bank projects. Last year, the EIB raised around $95 billion on the global bond market in this way. This, I should say, is the key difference between my legislation and the one that is circulating in the Senate. The Senate's bank could not issue bonds, thus limiting its ability to attract institutional investment. Uh, also, I think it's important uh, to note that um, the, uh, the, the White House has a proposal, uh, which is about a four, $4 billion uh, in, under the, uh, uh, the transportation uh, uh, in the transportation uh, 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 bailiwick. Uh, quite frankly, it's my view uh, that one, that the infrastructure project should not be just solely focused on transportation. It ought to be a, a diversity of infrastructure uh, projects. But there are additional uh, efforts that are floating around as well, including uh, Senator Rockefeller, uh, Senator Boxer does the surface transportation uh, legislation uh, on the House side. Uh, Congressman Micah with the Transportation uh, Committee. Uh, they are not, they, neither of them have a bank concept uh, 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 and are likely to plus up uh, the Build America bonds or, uh, which has expired as you uh, know, uh, but, or the TIFIA funds, which is the direction that they uh, would like to go in. Uh, in either case, my proposed bank, like the European bank, would consider applications for transportation, water, energy, and telecommunications uh, projects. Last year, the EIB financed 460 large projects, including, for example, upgrades to a 57-kilometer section of the Turin to Milan motorway in Italy, water and wastewater projects in Yorkshire, and a high-speed optical fiber network in the Netherlands. Uh, infrastructure projects, um, let me just, <clears throat> the bank would use a merit-based system to provide financing, loans, and loan guarantees to projects of regional and national significance with clear economic, environmental, and social benefits, as well as an identifiable and a reliable revenue stream uh, to ensure the bank is self-sustaining uh, and also has the capacity to pay back loans. It would encourage public-private partnerships in which a private entity partners with a region, state, or locality on a project, placing some of its own equity uh, into it. We know that with concern over the budget deficit that blankets every single discussion that we have in Washington today. With such a large infrastructure investment deficit in this country and with a lack of enough federal programs and fu funding to meet the problem head on, the private and public sectors are going to need to come together in some fashion if we are going to rebuild America and to stay competitive in a global environment. I believe that the Infrastructure Bank will make that happen. The chapters of our American success story have always been written in stone and in mortar, in iron and in steel, in granite, and in fiber optic cable. It is time for us now to write in bold strokes the next chapter in infrastructure investment for our nation. In short, the bank is exactly the type of a bold, outside-of-the-box thinking that we need right now to create jobs, to rebuild America, to foster long-term economic growth, and to generate a recovery that will last for years, if not for decades to come. Thank you. Um, former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs uh, at a dinner in Warrington. I got home about 2 in the morning, and Tom Pickering, when I introduced him, you know, look at all the uh, uh, countries he was ambassador to, that we finally gave him the UN. He was sort of ambassador of the world. There were about eight or nine. Uh, and that's sort of like Mark Warner with his committees. He must be on more committees than any other Senate. Banking, housing and urban affairs, budget, commerce, science and transportation, rules and administration and joint economic committee. And we have the thinnest sliver of his time. His staff was saying, don't go to this infrastructure conference. Don't do it. Uh, because he's at a markup right now that he really cares about it. But he said, we've got to come. I really thank you so much for being here. Please give a, a warm round of applause to Senator Mark Warner. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that introduction. And let me th thank the Atlantic, thank all of you for showing uh, interest in this area. I know you have heard from my good friend Rosa DeLauro, 
about her approach. I know you've heard from John Kerry, who I'm proud to partner with on the BUILD Act. I want to just hit uh, what I think are a couple of the, the high points around uh, this issue that, and, and try to add a little bit of a sense of urgency. Um, we think if you, you wouldn't be here if you're not kind of proactively forward. I see somebody like Bernard Schwartz here who's been arguing this case for 20 plus years, 25 plus years that I've been around politics. Um, but we really, this is more than, than just immediate jobs. This really goes to the heart of America's competitiveness. I mean, our infrastructure through most of the 20th century was a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis our competitors around the world. We've actually had a disinvestment in infrastructure since the 1970s as a percentage of GDP. We're down to about 2% at this point, John. And you, know, you, you look at Europe, of all places, has leapt ahead of us. China at 9%, Europe at 5% investment of GDP. We have a declining source of revenue that funds our basic transportation uh, infrastructure that has two competing policy goals. On one hand, thank goodness we're moving to more fuel-efficient vehicles, but if we base a lot of our transportation infrastructure around a gas tax, that's a declining source of revenue. It's not coming back. So how do we sort through this conundrum is at a moment when, candidly, there is very little appetite for large additional public investments in a traditional sense. And if you think this is a, you know, a problem right now, and perhaps the thing that I'm most involved in right now, other than these uh, committees, which is uh, the fact that I'm on a bunch of them is just a reflection of the fact that I'm the new guy here, and they stick you on a bunch of them that uh, don't always get a lot of stuff done, um, which may be the whole Senate this year. Uh, but you know, it, it involved in this bipartisan effort to grapple with the debt and deficit. And, you know, we are, we as a nation are kind of like Thelma and Louise about to race over the cliff with the most predictable financial crisis in our lifetimes. And we basically don't have most of our traditional tools left. We've used monetary policy, we've used fiscal stimulus, we've used bailout. And that means that where a lot of the focus on cutting has been, most of the whole debate so far has been around domestic discretionary spending. And guess what, folks? As you well know, domestic discretionary spending includes every bit of a federal investment in infrastructure. Uh, this is not a time to kind of play off deficit plans, but it does relate to this issue. You know, one of my greatest concerns with Congressman Ryan's plan, you know, I had concerns about his questions around Medicare and what have you, but that 12% of domestic discretionary spending, which is all of our research and development, all of our education investment at the federal level, all of our infrastructure investment, all of our energy investment, Net, net 12%, he would take that percentage down to about 5 to 6% over a 25 year period. Tell me what industrial country in the 21st century can compete without any investment in infrastructure, energy, R&D, and what have you. Again, that's not a critique of the plan as much as it is. We've got to think about different ways to skin this cat. And I commend uh, Rosa for her efforts on the her approach, I, I am intrigued, and I'm sorry I missed the earlier panel about how you get the specifics of, of this right. I think that is a real, uh, a real um, uh, challenge. I think that uh, what Senator Kerry and Senator Hutchinson and I have done with this Build America Act, it is, it is more modest. It is $10 billion. It is only loans rather than grants. It doesn't, as, as Rosa mentioned, have the bonding authority. Uh, there may be other ways um, to improve it, but we've got to crack the code on alternative ways to invest in infrastructure. Um, as governor of Virginia, I was proud of the fact that we put forward one of the first public-private partnerships uh, in Virginia. And, you know, for those of you who live in the region, I'd love to say that solved all of the region's transportation problems. You know, it hasn't, but it is a new tool, just as this infrastructure investment bank is not going to solve all our problems. But it ought to be a tool. And one of the challenges that we have in terms of leveraging private money, I'll close with this comment, and I know they may we're going to take some questions. Was that? Or were they kicking me out? Or what are you doing with me? All right. Um, uh, was because I got to go do the deficit pitch in a minute. Um, is that? And, and, and I would love to get from the experts in this room um, reflection on that. Uh, on this, two two questions. One is, could we, if we put together a 
infrastructure investment bank. And this would be not part of the Kerry proposal, so this is an independent Warner idea. Um, but I desperately believe that one of the other challenges we have in America on infrastructure projects is the time from idea to actually moving Earth. Our regulatory and permitting process has really dramatically expanded over the years. Now, we need to do that and make appropriate environmental reviews, appropriate other permitting reviews. But when we are so far behind the eight ball, when the world's fastest bullet train is in, is in Shanghai rather than America, we ought to at least explore for at least certain designated projects an ability to expedite the review and approval process because, as we all know, time is money. And if we can shorten that approval process, at least for certain, particularly energy-related projects, it ought to be in the mix, number one. Number two, um, you know, we really need to push the edge from some of the better financial minds about how we get this right. I would argue that the last decade, the only place that we had real innovation in America was in the financial sector. And that innovation that was supposed to be about lowering the cost of risk, in many cases we found, really created a bunch of financial instruments that rather than lowering cost of risk, kind of tied things into this financial house of cards. I was the co-founder of Nextel, so I don't mind your cell phone being on, sir. Doesn't bother me at all. Um, <clears throat> um, but I do think with the, you know, we almost in a certain way, with the ability for capital to move globally so quickly, and the ability to have things where you can, you know, trade an overnight currency exchange on a, what would be a so-called limit or risk-free basis to guarantee a return, how do we have with this infrastructure bank, and perhaps with even change of the tax code, incentives to really have patient capital investment again. Because at the end of the day, unless you've got patient capital, unless you've got really a value towards long-term capital, we're not going to get it right. The infrastructure investment bank that we've proposed, which would help buy down interest rates, which would help fill this gap, I think is one of those tools. It is affordable. It is bipartisan. It can be leveraged many, many times based upon uh, anyone's analysis, even in these tight deficit times. It is a critical piece of not just the direct jobs that it would create, but, you know, I, I believe, uh, and I'll close with this, that, um, you know, the greatest job creation effort we could, we could take on right now. Um, and the infrastructure is a piece of this. Frankly, getting the deficit plan in place is a piece of this. Is getting that $2.2 trillion in cash that's sitting on American balance sheets off the sidelines reinvested in America. Part of that is showing that we in Congress have got the, the wherewithal to meet our deficit prob problems over the long haul. Secondly would be to actually have a plan in place so that as we start to remanufacture and rebuild in America, we've got the infrastructure to move those goods and ideas in a 21st century way. So uh, I thanks, my thanks to the Atlantic, my thanks to all of you, and let's see if we can get this done. Thank you very much. Senator, thank you so much. I would just say, as we're just short on time, and we want, uh, I see uh, Nick over here uh, trying to get us out, get the senator out of the room, but, but I do want to invite in a moment, we're going to have a very good uh, exchange between, I'm going to ask you one question, because Kay Bailey Hutchison is coming. Here's the quick question. How deep do you think the support is in the Republican caucus, as you see it, for the same sort, if not the plan, the notion about investment in the country? Do, is there a larger sense that that matters in a significant way vis-a-vis -vis other things? And maybe just a quick well, answer great, on that. Great, um, great question. Uh, you know, infrastructure investment has been one of those areas that for years has been a bipartisan issue on a Democrat or Republican road, uh, or water system, or frankly, fiber optic network. Um, there is enormous, enormous pressure right now. And, you know, and some of it is, you know, I'm not here to uh, criticize because, you know, the worst thing that could happen to building infrastructure, the worst thing that could happen to job creation is a default on our debt, which might see an interest rate spike to 8 or 10 or 12 or 15 percent. You say that's not possible, but listen, credit default swaps in terms of making sure the price of a credit default swap today on the chances of Americans default in August is higher than the price of guaranteeing there's not going to be a credit default for Mexico, for Panama, for the Philippines. So in effect, the markets are already saying they are a better bet than we are. $14.5 trillion of debt we add $4 billion a day to. This is an imminent problem that we have to deal with. 
Now, we have more runway, so I do think our Republican colleagues, you know, are, are very concerned about that. We and the Democrats are as well. It's going to take a balance on both sides. I think what we have put together, and again, Senator Kerry, Kerry is the lead sponsor on this, and he has done the yeoman's amount of work, is an approach that is doable at this $10 billion number that starts this ball rolling, that focuses on loans. Uh, in a more perfect world, a broader approach might be better, but this has got the support of the chamber, the uh, labor community, and part of my job is to say, even in these tight times to our Republican colleagues, this is a revenue generator and a job generator, and I think we can very well make that case. Senator, thank, thank you. you. Ladies and gentlemen, you. Senator J Mark Warner. Okay, I'm going to invite my, uh, my uh, friends. You know, there have been comments. Laura, Rosa DeLauro a minute ago talked about um, uncomfortable bedfellows. What I do know is Thea Lee and John, uh, John Engler are sitting in the, their front row fellows uh, and seem to be doing just fine with each other. But let me invite uh, former Governor uh, John Engler and Thea Lee up to the podium. I want to make a, just a quick comment, uh, housekeeping. For those of you who want to eat, stay in your seats. Uh, we are going to feed you at your seats. We've got chicken tuna and um, turkey. If you don't like the box that you're getting, just pass it on. It's like United Airlines style. We have an outstanding group of staff. I love them so much. I think we should give them all a round of applause for the hard work. They're going to bring you food to your seats. Go ahead and eat uh, because we're going to have now uh, some fun discussing not necessarily people that are exactly on the same page on these issues, but it has been striking that uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the AFL uh, have both had their leaders. In fact, there was a meeting this morning uh, where uh, members of both were talking about the need to do something to get the equation of investment in a different track within the United States. And I invited uh, Governor John Engler, president now of the Business Roundtable, uh, former governor, of course, state of Michigan, uh, Michigan State Senator, and, and uh, he has uh, uh, been someone that I've been paying attention to and watching for a long time who's been taking these fundamental issues of labor and investment and getting it right for a long time. But he straddles a lot of experiences, and he has insights into being a chief executive of a state struggling with reinvention, but also at the same time looking at the stresses and strains within the American business community today. And it's a real pleasure to have John Engler with us. And then my great old friend, Thea Lee, who's known me since I was just uh, starting out in this town. Uh, I have gotten older um, and, and she has not aged a day ever. Uh, she is, of course, when I first met her, uh, Chief International Economist of the AFL-CIO. Uh, she's recently become Deputy Chief of Staff. We've been talking about trade and economic policy in so many dimensions for so many years. She's really one of the best people in this city to think about what the national uh, dimensions of America's economic interests should be and how to think about them in an international and global context as well. So it's such a pleasure to have uh, Thea Lee with, her, with us. So let me invite John Engler uh, to share his views with us first. I'm going to invite him to the podium. Uh, then I will invite Thea Lee, and then, of course, after that, we'll be, be joined by Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. Uh, John. And you can clap. Uh, well, thank you very much, Steve. And I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, yesterday, yesterday when, when Steve called and suggested that uh, there was time on the schedule and that uh, Thea might be available and he'd put the two of us together, uh, I agreed to come down. I said, I think this is such an important topic, and it's one that I think uh, the federal government needs to be very much focused on. The numbers, and we've been hearing them this morning uh, from the various speakers, are pretty compelling, though. One thing that I bring, I guess, is a perspective like uh, Senator Governor Warner, uh, the state and local uh, contribution on infrastructure is about 75 percent of public infrastructure spending, so that's where the lion's share is. So whatever we think up, We've sort of got to make it work and got to understand how that state and local piece fits in. The, the imperative to move on infrastructure could be clearer, I think. Uh, our infrastructure spending today is about, uh, in real dollars, where it was in the late 60s. Uh, uh, and the economy is a third. Uh, uh, if, we, if we think about the size, how much bigger our economy is today, my goodness, that, that really is a diminution of our investment. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit about just the concept of the bank, uh, which I agree with Tom Donahue. I think there's a place for that. I know that uh, we had iterations of this in the past. Senator Wyden at one point uh, brought one forward with Senator Thune and, 
Uh, I recall doing a press conference with them out on the front of the Capitol lawn. Uh, the Build Act that's now pending has much that recommends it. Uh, and I think infrastructure spending is essential. I recall back in, in the 80s, we actually, the last time we did transportation tax increase was part of a strategy to get infrastructure moving as part of the recovery uh, in the early 80s from the recession of that time. We haven't touched the gas tax, fuel taxes since then. Now, I'm a governor that raised fuel taxes and even dedicated part of that, fat, that uh, fuel tax toward a bridge repair. Uh, I think the bridge numbers are pretty compelling. 26 to 30 percent of our bridges are either deficient or obsolete in the country today. Uh, you know, we get a grade of D. That's well known from the uh, uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, we've got brownfields, uh, some nearly 200 sites in cities and most of those in populous areas. Many of those along rivers and in wonderful spots if they were uh, reclaimed. Uh, again, back to our, our Michigan days, we actually did a clean water bond, bonded for this and went at the idea of cleaning up brownfield sites in cities and ended up uh, creating significant number of jobs on the front end on the cleanup and then many many more on the reuse potential once those sites were put back into functionality there are some other things though that i think uh need to be in this discussion today uh, and both parties have an obligation uh i think that uh Mr. schwartz you've written about this is some one of those things that ought to be bipartisan and i agree with that it should be um, one of the things that we need today is the ability, if we had a, if we had a stack of cash, if this room were filled full of uh, $1,000 bills ready to do infrastructure, we probably couldn't get the permits. And we've got to fix that process. So I think there needs to be a build permit process uh, piece of legislation goes right along with us, a one-stop shop so that we can actually get permits. If you're rebuilding transmission lines, for example, on existing rights of way, why on earth are, are we slowing down permits and approvals there? Why can't we accelerate that? There have been attempts in the past. There have to be uh, partnerships worked out with state and local government, but there's also got to be firm timelines. We've got to be able to make decisions. One thing we, want, we may want to make, rather than having capital get tied up in the bank, is that when you come and ask for a loan, uh, maybe you've got to have your permit in hand. Maybe there's a way to do that, to accelerate that, to put the pressure on so that projects that get funded can actually get built. Uh, I think we've got to have a, uh, a process. I said to Senator Warner on the way out, uh, we, we, we've got to avoid the humpback bridge problem. Uh, that, and any of you come in from the airport, been over that bridge, looks like it might get done this year. But how many years has that little bridge been under work, underway? I mean, they built the Wilson Bridge almost as fast as they've repaired the humpback bridge. And that's the kind of thing that'll kill an infrastructure bank quicker than anything is projects that are supposed to be funded and then can't get permitted or if they can't they can't get built properly interestingly enough there's a lot of experience with this states do this all the time and corporations do it the real uh, challenge that we're addressing here with our infrastructure bank is a failure of the federal government to have a, a true capital budgeting process we have a disaster of an approach toward capital budgeting and it seems to me uh, one of the benefits of an infrastructure bank at, at whatever level is maybe to get to start to teach people how to do capital budgeting uh, because i operate from the assumption that in today's environment um, the economic climate we're, we're not going to be able to add uh, millions of dollars of debt uh, to the federal government's balance sheet we're going to have to make these things have an roi and many of them do uh, one that i talk a lot about is the air traffic control system which is absurd that we've got a 20-year strategy to do a project which probably would be three years if we just funded it and let it get built. And if we try to do it over 20 years, and this is something you know a little bit about, having been in the satellite business, you cannot, it seems to me, do something over 20 years when your technology is going to change three or four times. You need to build it now, and then we can export it. So I, I think that there's a lot that, that can be done. Um, I'm interested to hear what Thea's got to say, and then I think we've, if I stop now, Steve will give us time for some questions, which is really what maybe we get a little audience participation this morning instead of being talked at. You can talk with us. Thank you very much. Governor Engler, thank you very much. Now let me invite Thea Lee uh, to join us. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you, Governor Engler, for your remarks. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning with all of you talking about this very important subject. Uh, 
the issue of infrastructure and the urgent imperative for our country to invest both more than we have done over a very sustained period of time and to do so more strategically, more cost effectively and with adequate financing is one that unites labor and business and de Democrats and Republicans as well it should. Uh, we have often sparred, and I have often sparred, with our business friends over trade policy. And we fight about the free trade agreements and the details and the, uh, the priorities that our country has with respect to trade policy. But the truth is that if the United States government and business and labor don't, we don't get our act together to deal with the gaping, shameful uh, gaps in infrastructure, both existing infrastructure and the future infrastructure, the modernization of infrastructure that we need, all the trade policy squabbles that we've had over the last couple of decades are going to seem pretty irrelevant because the United States is going to be left so far behind by our own choices, our own failures to invest, that we won't have anything left to fight about in terms of trade policy. And we have, of course, the two different issues that folks have talked about uh, today the basic maintenance and safety of our existing infrastructure, our existing bridges and roads and water systems and sewage. And then secondly, and no less important, the, our need to modernize and improve and revolutionize our, our systems if we want to be 10 years from now a global leader in a dynamic global economy. And I think it goes beyond transportation. Transportation is absolutely crucial. But when we think about infrastructure, we really do need to think about energy systems, as other folks have talked about this morning, and communication as well. And I think particularly in the energy area, which is connected, of course, to transportation, you can see the three-pronged the three -pronged benefits of significant and sustained investments in modernization and, and more energy sustainability. The productivity competitiveness benefits, which of course are important. The, uh, the energy efficiency itself and the contributions to, to, to global warming and to reducing our imported, our reliance on imported energy sources. And then the job creation. And so when you take all those things together, I think it really is puzzling why a city like Washington has tied itself in so many knots that we are unable to muster the political will uh, to, to address these issues. And the consequences, of course, of failing to invest in infrastructure is not just the loss of jobs and the loss of business, but growing inequality, the loss of the middle class and communities, and the basic safety concerns that a wealthy country like the United States shouldn't be in a position where we don't know when we drive onto a bridge with our families whether the bridge is going to fall into the river or stay, they stay stable, and whether our air traffic control system is adequate to the 21st century. We shouldn't have to be asking those questions of ourselves uh, at a time like this in the year 2011. The Urban Land Institute study that Rosa DeLauro mentioned lays out in pretty stark terms the depth and breadth of our infrastructure deficit, and also how we stack up to our international competitors. And that is a pretty important issue because the, how much infrastructure investment we need to do isn't just a question of what we need. But it's a question of what we need, as Steve said, to compete in a global economy. And if our main competitors, our main industrial rivals, Germany, China, Japan, Australia, uh, the European Union, are, are investing significant amounts more than we are, the question is that the timing of it is something that we all need to be paying attention to. Because it's not the kind of thing we're going to wake up 10 years from now and say, oh, you know what, we forgot to invest in infrastructure. Let's do it now. By then, it is too late. It is too late by the time we figure it out. But I, I do want to lay out a few things that are important with respect to the infrastructure bank and all the proposals that have been out there. And we really appreciate the work that both the Senate and the House have done uh, to, to bring this to fruition. First is how important it is that we include strong Buy America language so that when we are investing in infrastructure, we are also supporting our manufacturing sector and that we are making sure that the United States has control over the technology and the research and the development that goes into whether it's wind or um, high speed rail or whatever it is. But we need to make sure that we, we have both pieces of that in place and that's crucial to the success of any infrastructure investment and certainly an infrastructure bank. The second is project labor uh, agreements to make sure that the jobs that are created are good jobs, are family supporting jobs in the community. And the third is uh, also making sure that what we are, while we do want to make to attract private funding, private public partnerships to fund the infrastructure that we need, that we are not 
directly or indirectly financing the privatization of publicly owned facilities so that we make sure that we are maintaining the importance of those, um, those products, th those, um, those projects. But the key challenges we face, and I'm going to wrap up quickly also because I'm interested in your questions, as is uh, Governor Engler, is scale, timing, and financing. And I think our main concern with respect to scale is that while infrastructure bank proposals are really important and we hope that they will succeed uh, along, the scale, along the lines that I discussed, they're not going to supplant the need for significant federal and state financing of infrastructure. When we talk about the scale that the American Society of Civil Engineers and others who have looked at this issue are talking about, we're talking two trillion to repair existing infrastructure and another couple of trillion to bring uh, our, our systems into the 21st century, whether it's high-speed rail or a smart electrical grid or broadband systems. These are things that are costly, that other countries are investing in, that we need to do. That's a scale of several hundred billion dollars a year every year for the next 10 years and probably for the foreseeable future. We're not going to be able to fund that with a $10 billion infrastructure bank. So let's be real and let's be honest about the kinds of needs we're going to have for revenues to fund the infrastructure we need. This is good for business, and it's good for labor, and it's essential for all of us to, to figure out how we can find some sensible and fair revenue measures, otherwise known as taxes, uh, to fund the infrastructure that we all agree that we need. Some people would say the United States is too broke to afford significant infrastructure investment. Not at a time like this, we can't talk about it, we're broke. I've heard that from a lot of folks uh, on the Hill in the last couple of weeks, or last couple of years. And we can't even afford the world-class uh, workforce development and training and education that we need. I don't think I have to say that this is really idiotic kinds of thinking. We are not broke. We're not poor today. We are a wealthy country today. We can afford to, to invest in the infrastructure we need. And the fact is that if we don't invest in the infrastructure we need and the kinds of improvement and modernization that we are talking about here in this room today, I can guarantee you we will be broke. 10 years from now. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and I look forward to working with the business community to get this done. Thea, thank you so much and uh, thank you for the, uh, the spirit of goodwill. I think, you know, as a blogger, um, I write the Washington Note, which is becoming part of the Atlantic uh, family. Uh, it's interesting how, when you're in that world, how little civility there is anymore. And it's nice to see uh, that issues can drive that sort of civility, which is so key in getting anything done anymore. Um, I did want to open the floor to questions. We're remarkably on time. Uh, can't quite believe it. But uh, Senator Hutchison will be joining us as soon as she's here. We're going to uh, uh, move forward. But I, I'd like to open the floor. Do we have guys with mics out there ready to go? Uh, we're going to go right over here, but as we're moving the microphone this way and we'll move it over here, I want to just pose a question. My two, from my point of relative ignorance about the, uh, the bill, I would, I would raise two questions that I would have, um, just as a naive person think, thinking about writing this. One is, we've heard a lot about capital budgeting. Since I worked for Senator Bingham years ago and was thinking about the state of New Mexico, it never made sense to me that this this, you know, both chambers of Congress weren't able to do the things that, that, that made more sense from a financial return on investment, capital budgeting. And if there was a capital budgeting system, if you had a choice between infrastructure bank and uh, 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 capital, you know, budgeting, would you, would you get a systemic impact very quickly with capital budgeting if you did just what was sane, in my view? That, that's one question. And the second is, that I think maybe is politically incorrect, but I think it's important, um, Fannie Mae wasn't, hasn't turned out to be such a successful hybrid institution that really did uh, hit the public interest in the right way. Um, what do you think needs to be done to prevent another institution from going that track? In other words, to kind of raise, if you will, the vital, you know, the vital side of getting Infrastructure Bank right, but not distorting market signals to such a point that you got what we saw after Fannie Mae. I don't know if either of you want to respond, but, but then I'll move to the audience. You want to do Fannie Mae? Uh, the the uh, I'll just take the capital budgeting part and the, I mean the legislation the the pros and cons there's a discussion about how this would be different than uh, Fannie and Freddie and uh, uh, Farmer Mac and you know a, a different approach uh, the, the the one thing that is in this proposal also which is kind of interesting is an independent board while nominated by leaders in the Congress and appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The idea is independence to insulate so that uh, these are truly uh, decisions made based on merit and, and that the projects have to both be of certain size and scale to be approved, but also are supposed to be 
depoliticized because clearly a, a bank like this, you, you would say any project, I guess, is technically, in the old words, uh, an earmark. Uh, I mean, you, you decide what you're going to do. The, but Thea made a point. I want to come back to it because let's say you did the bank just the way it's proposed and you did $10 billion. That's a drop in the bucket compared to what the national needs are. And, and we can't forget that. There's a lot of private capital that's ready to go to work if it could be uh, permitted today. And that's that's not an insignificant uh, question. There are rules pending, uh, for example, a conversation over at EPA on an ozone rule, dropping ozone limits from 0 0.075 down to 0 0.60. Negligible impact on air quality, $90 billion cost. Imagine if you had $90 billion. If you thought that was rational, take the $90 billion and put that towards something. That So it's a question of priority setting. And I think sometimes... Uh, nobody looks at the totality of, of what's being done because I, I'd rather do that. If we got rid of new source review, which is kind of a sacred cow today, we'd begin immediately to upgrade power plants all over the country. Almost all of those jobs would be trades jobs, and they would happen right now. They'd start because that makes the power plant more efficient. And, uh, Congresswoman DeLauro talked about the energy generation needs. Well, efficiency is a great way to get it. So, so I, when we talk infrastructure, I think the bank is important, but, but we would sell ourselves way short of what the job creation potential is if we fixed some of the other uh, infrastructure barriers that are implicit in either regulation or policy that's either been made by agencies or by Congress. Thank you. Fia? Thank you. Um, in terms of capital budgeting, Steve, I think you're right that, that – the way that the Congress looks at the money that it has and the money that it needs and so on isn't rational because there's a huge difference between spending and investment, as I think um, the piece by Bernard Schwartz pointed out it, that, that's in our folder here today. And not making that distinction just doesn't make any sense because there's so, – so I think that, that Congress needs to rethink the way it, it is viewing the, the different kinds of expenditures that come before it. I, I think the Fannie Mae issue is really important that you maintain appropriate government oversight over any spending because part of what we need is a national infrastructure plan that is rational both in terms of region, geography, where the money goes, but also what kinds of projects it goes to. The projects have to be connected to each other. I think you mentioned earlier, Governor Engler, about you know a lot of infrastructure spending comes at the state and local level, and that's true, but I think we also don't have at the moment a really appropriate mechanism to make sure that this, the state infrastructure spending is, uh, is rational and coherent in the context of national needs. And that's one thing that you want to make sure that you're looking out for in a public-private partnership, that you don't sacrifice the, the national overview and the national priorities and principles that are important uh, in, in order to get the funding. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take just you, it, it, it's got to be a five second question. Uh, I was just wondering, um, just as a sequencing matter to all this, to what extent um, has do you are you uh, confident that the energy policy discussion, uh, you know, which right. is which is implicated, well, is so we're just going to leave it at energy policy discussion and sequencing. Uh, quick reactions to senators here, and I've been told we've got to go right away. Okay. So um, response. Well, uh, we have no energy policy. That's the big problem. Uh, but we ought to be – we ought not have three agencies investigating fracking. We ought to encourage shale gas. We ought, to, we ought to say that the BP disaster is over, and we ought to put drilling in the Gulf back to where it was before. We ought to permit Alaska and get that started because there's a lot of jobs there. Then we ought to build the gas pipeline that's necessary. Uh, you know, there, there are literally thousands of jobs waiting for uh, the government to get out of the way, and those are all – all privately funded. No government money necessary there on those. So what's not to like about any of that? I guess I would just say one word. The se seamless coordination between energy, infrastructure, manufacturing, and trade policy, which we don't really have today, and taxation, throw that in for good measure. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is, as I understand it, uh, would an institution like this actually displace the private sector or actually work with the private sector I think some people who work with government institutions wonder if the private, are you basically displacing private sector activity uh, or are you enhancing it? I think it's a legitimate question. Oh, I think the key for a lot of infrastructure is that there is no incentive, uh, no profit incentive for the private sector to invest, for example, in a bridge. I mean, we, we could set up tolls on every sidewalk, every bridge, every road, but I don't think that would be an efficient way of, of running things. And we th think about other things like making, you know, government buildings energy efficient or, 
um, or ensuring that the, the water system is safe and so on. I, there, there's a huge difference between what the government responsibility is and the government role is here, and that the private sector won't on its own figure out how to fund all of the public goods that we share, the transportation and so on. And so I, I think that's the least of our worries for the, for the moment in terms of displacing private sector. We don't see the private sector jumping up to fund bridges. I, I think that the data was that there's something like $100 billion of U.S. pension funds and private equity dollars have been spent around the world, but not here. There's the opportunity, according to some estimates, of nearly $200 billion of potentially being available here. So I, I think it's a question of incenting um, and accelerating now, I do think that one of, the, one of the tough things is how do, you, how do you avoid political correctness? I mean, high-speed rail is in vogue. There isn't anybody in this room that wants to make a case that high-speed rail will ever pay off. So, so who wants to lose the money? Uh, there's no private investment that will go in and, and take that one on. Um, so if you're going to have it, uh, you're going to have to persuade some taxpayer to give it up. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, sewers and waters, uh, they've got user fees, and those are pretty easy to incent. I think highways are hard because the the gas tax is sort of worn out. Uh, fuel efficient vehicles, here comes the center, and, and no taxes on some vehicles that don't use uh, you know carbon anymore. Uh, that's all going to have to be changed. But I do think there's one big fuel tax someday left, and uh, Senator Hutchinson uh, can sort that all out when she gets here. <laughs> T terrific. I want to uh, please give a round of applause to uh, John Engler, yeah. Governor John Engler, and Thea Lee. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's great to have labor and the corporate sector together talking about uh, these important issues and, and kicking the tires, as we said we would do. I'm very pleased that Senator Hutchison has joined us. We're going to just go ahead and proceed with the program. I know her schedule is so tight. Um, <clears throat> Bernard Schwartz, uh, uh, who has helped uh, underwrite today's program, I want to just say for the cameras that are here uh, streaming this live, I want to thank you again uh, for your support uh, of today's program uh, sponsored by The Atlantic. And uh, for those of you watching, I'm Steve Clemens, uh, Washington editor-at-large of The Atlantic, and it's uh, a pleasure to be, uh, have you here with us today on this important program, uh, thinking about America's infrastructure deficit and what to do about it. Let me just say a few words about Senator Hutchison. Uh, that she may not uh, know. Of course, uh, she's from the great state of Texas, uh, representing Texas here in the United States Senate. Uh, she also, along with Senator John Kerry, Senator Mark Warner, uh, introduced the BUILD Act. Uh, she's the ranking member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation, member of the Committee on Appropriations, Committee on Rules. Uh, these are the power posts uh, in the Senate. You know, you sort of, you know, have the power posts and the sort of uh, folks that are vanity posts, I suppose, but these are the power posts. When I worked for Jeff Bingaman in the United States Senate in 1996 after I left the Nixon Center, I went to a Semiconductor Industry Association dinner in 1996 and Senator Hutchison received an award from the Semiconductor Industry Association. Uh, and she came in and talked about competitiveness, Texas, what was going on with the semiconductor industry, how important it was to put all the pieces together when it came to partnering with the state, with universities. Uh, I worked with Bob Gates a bit when he was head of Texas A&M University and we're thinking about these questions. Senator Hutchison has been thinking for a long time about competitiveness, what the, in, the right kinds of inputs to a state should be, and how to get the larger equation right. And I think it's uh, been very important to note her leadership with this uh, Build Act proposal. I want to thank uh, very much. Please, a warm round of applause uh, for Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Well, Steve, thank you very much for holding this. Bernie, it's great to see you, and I know you were an instigator of this. Um, I want to thank all of you. You've had a lot of sitting and listening today, um, and I, I'm very pleased that you're taking the, the opportunity to do it, and I hope that you're not just um, fatigued from sitting. But uh, let me first of all say thank you to Bernie for having this vision for a very long time. Um, I took the opportunity when I was in New York to have breakfast and uh, really pick Bernie's brain about how we should make sure that our structure was right. Um, I also have consulted my friend Phil Graham, uh, who now works in New York a lot, but um, he too gave me some very good suggestions on making sure that we set it up right, because I do think that success or failure of a national infrastructure bank is going to be determined by 
whether we have the right setup, the right governance, the right financial expertise, the ability to do the leveraging uh, in the exact correct way. Um, but Steve, when you said I've been at this a long time, um, actually a really long time, because in 1993, when I was state treasurer of Texas, uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, had a commission to promote investment in America's infrastructure, uh, appointed me as a state treasurer uh, to that commission, and we actually recommended a new financing option for large infrastructure projects, including establishing a new federally chartered financial entity, a national infrastructure corporation. That was 1993. Um, that was 20, over 20 years ago, obviously, um, getting on 30, and now we are still working on it. And we have not been able to do it, I think, and the infrastructure gap has widened further. Uh, so I, I will applaud my um, sponsor of the bill, Senator Kerry, from whom you heard earlier today, and say that he, this is really his passion, and I respect him very much because when he started with his bill, uh, it was not the same bill that it is today. And he was willing to work with me, and uh, there was a lot of compromise back and forth because I feel that one of the keys to this being done right and being accepted, um, I think, by all the factions or most of the factions in our Congress, uh, would mean that we have to make it a real bank. Uh, we have to leverage private investment, and the whole point, of course, is to have more private investment with our infrastructure gap in this country, but also that we would not have grants as a part of it. Because if you start having grants, in my opinion, uh, then you're getting into really a, a whole different arena where there are winners and losers based not on quality always, but subjective uh, criteria, and I feel that objective criteria, including a revenue stream, is the way to assure that there is quality, that there is going to be a revenue stream for payback, and therefore the project uh, is going to stand on its own because it will be a good enough project to attract that private sector funding. Uh, and Senator Kerry worked with me on that. That was not in his original plan, but he did work uh, with me, and I really appreciate it. Uh, we differ from President Obama's um, infrastructure bank in that his is only transportation, and ours includes energy and water, because if there is anything neglected in this country, uh, it is the next generation of energy infrastructure, as well as uh, the many needs for water in our country. Um, the water needs are going to be not only very expensive, but very creative. Um, I will just give you an example of one that is very creative and uh, is working extremely well, and that is uh, a new... Uh, desalination plant. It's the largest inland desalination plant in the world uh, in El Paso, Texas. And um, Fort Bliss is one of our largest army bases, but there, the water shortage was beginning to be a problem for the U.S. Army to expand there. So uh, very creative engineers, uh, along with the U.S. Army, uh, put together a desalination plant where um, they built an infrastructure that goes down a mile to get water in, in a very dry part of uh, our country, and it is now producing hundreds of thousands of gallons of clean water uh, for the city of El Paso as well as for Fort Bliss. Uh, that couldn't have been done without a lot of creativity and uh, infrastructure money because it was very expensive in the beginning. It's actually now much cheaper uh, because... Uh, the water availability is there, but uh, a place that is as far inland as El Paso would have had a 
um, an impossible time to get clean water without this kind of investment. Those are the kinds of things where I think partnerships can really make a difference, and I think this opens up, uh, our bill opens up the possibilities for more in the future. Uh, another difference from ours, from President Obama's, is that it doesn't have grants, uh, which President Obama's does. Uh, the administration one is a $30 billion investment, uh, whereas ours is $10 billion, but it is going to be a revolving uh, loan account, so hopefully we will be able to have repayments and replenish the account so that it is ongoing. And um, I think seeing how that can work and making it self-sustaining it was is going to be one of the uh, chief um, good talking points that we have for ours. Um, also, one of the limits that I think makes ours effective is that the infrastructure bank will never provide more than half of a project's cost. So again, uh, you are going to provide a long-term financing capability, but you're going to assure that there is a private sector or a government, a local or state government investment that also assures the quality of the product. Um, and so that the chances of it being paid back are very good. Um, I think that um, our another factor of our bill that's important is that because we're going to open up private sector, we're going to open up building of infrastructure, it should uh, certainly be a factor in creating more economic activity in our country, which means jobs. And, uh, of course, that's a long term, but uh, certainly uh, we think that is an important part of it. Um, we have a Texas model that made me want to support uh, and be a part of this bill, and that is a state infrastructure bank that is much the same concept. It is for transportation only. Um, but it also, uh, on a smaller scale, does leverage private and local funding. And so the concept is very similar and one that I think um, we can also use to show that this can be successful. So uh, I just am very pleased that there are this many of you interested in this kind of opportunity. I was very pleased that uh, Governor Engler uh, also has been supportive of this because he as a governor um, in Michigan knew uh, of the needs and also from the private sector um, in the organization that he runs now uh, can see what an important investment this will be for economic uh, activity in our country. I really want to thank once again uh, John Kerry for uh, going forward with a bold move and working with me uh, to uh, gain my co-sponsorship and I think that the two of us have come together uh, to make a very strong bill that should um, really be able to get bipartisan support uh, even in this very tough economic uh, atmosphere. And the fact that it's a $10 billion investment I think is modest. Uh, the fact that it's going to be a revolving account, and um, we're looking for offsets so that it won't have any cost whatsoever uh, if we can possibly find the $10 billion in offsets, and uh, Senator Kerry and I have agreed to work on that as well. So Bernie Schwartz, thanks a million for uh, calling this convocation and uh, for supporting it as you have uh, from the beginning. I've learned a lot from you at our breakfast and look forward to many more times. Thank you very much. Senator Hutchison, thank you so much. On behalf of the Atlantic, thank you so much for doing today's program. I want to thank everyone. I would like to, because it's our nature uh, in the media business, to pose one question by me. I wanted to mention that Senator Lindsey Graham uh, is also uh, a co Republican colleague of yours who has helped introduce this, this bill. And, and that leads me to my, my single question we'll have before we'll adjourn today's program. And that is, how high, if at all, a hill do you face collectively uh, on the, within, within the Senate on this bill? How do you think, after you've crafted this, thought of this, come to negotiate with John Kerry about what the contours of the bill, what is your gut about the likelihood that other members will say, wow, we really do need some mechanism uh, for investment? Do you, do you have other believers in your caucus? Well, Steve, I think that uh, this is going to be um, a hill but a hill that we need to climb. And it's, it's in this area 
uh, but it's also in the area of research. It is the things that you don't see as the very most immediate needs, and the, it is things that will take an investment uh, in order to get the return. Um, and I think there are a good number of people on both sides of the aisle um, who do see the need for uh, building for the future, uh, infrastructure, research, research, research into science and technology. Uh, we can't sit in America because the economy's bad. We have to prioritize the spending that we do wisely. And the priorities should be um, investing in our seed corn, and that is both uh, infrastructure and um, academic research. As all of you know, uh, America is not the major manufacturing base that it used to be. Uh, we have kept the vibrant economy in the world, in the global marketplace, through creativity and through being ahead of the curve of what is going to be next in uh, either need or want in our society. And if we are going to keep that edge, since we don't have a manufacturing edge, um, and that's not our strong suit, we must invest in what will keep us economically strong so that we will be able to continue to be vibrant. And I would say this is a hill to climb, but it is one that we've got to really, really work, and that's where many of you in the audience will be helpful, and that is to focus, focus, focus on the pointing out to our elected leaders the need for these kinds of investments. When you talk about we have hundreds of billions of dollars of unmet infrastructure needs, that kind of goes over people's heads. But if you talk about uh, the specifics in a different area, like uh, losing Fort Bliss from El Paso, Texas, because we didn't have the water infrastructure, or it could be an electric grid, or it could be uh, the windmills for uh, wind power or solar power, uh, panels for investment. If you talk about those specifics, people can see that you have to make certain investments in order to get the cheap, clean energy. And um, so we've got to keep selling that. And um, I think with this kind of interest, we can. Great. Senator Hutchinson, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Senator, and thank you for your leadership. I also want to just commend the staff people of both Senator Kerry, Senator Hutchison, many of the other senators that have been involved. There have so many, been so many uh, people involved that, that I'd like to thank, but we're out of time. Uh, from the think tank sector, I want to thank uh, uh, my other home institution, the Atlantic Now, uh, for sponsoring today's program, and particularly uh, thank the Senate for hosting us here today. Uh, my good friend Heidi Crabo Redeker was the, uh, the, the maestro behind the scenes on much of this. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, to all of the staff, wherever you may be, uh, who've worked on this, thank you. Uh, meeting is adjourned. And Bernard, thank you, sir. Thank you so much.